Uh, my name is Brandon Schroeder. I work with uh, Michigan State University Extension and uh, in the Michigan Sea Grant program. Our program is all about uh, exactly what we're doing tonight. Our, our program is about connecting uh, Great Lakes research, supporting Great Lakes research and science, and connecting that with communities and making that research and science useful in communities like our, our Saginaw Bay communities here. So I'm excited. This is our first of four uh, regional Lake Huron fisheries workshops. We're kicking off right here in uh, Standish on the topic of Saginaw Bay largely. Uh, we'll be heading to the Thumb, to Bad Axe uh, next week and then up to Rogers City the week after and we'll end our series in Cedarville uh, and should have four great conversations about connecting science and research with our communities on the topic of uh, you know valuing and, and protecting and, and enjoying our Great Lakes fisheries. So uh, I want to welcome everybody tonight. Thank you guys for taking time out of your busy evenings to join us for an evening of Talking Fish. It's a beautiful evening. There's probably lots of other things we could be doing, but this is a, a great excuse uh, to, to be inside and chat about our wonderful fisheries. So uh, the way I look at this workshop is this is a broad spectrum. This is a pulse check. This is our annual checkup. Uh, uh, it's a chance that we've brought together a great uh, wealth of, of awesome research and managers from a variety of agencies and universities who study Lake Huron and help protect Lake Huron, and they're here to share a broad overview, sort of a status check of how Lake Huron's doing, who caught what, where last year, and what we can expect uh, in terms of, of, of management in the fishery uh, in, in the season to come. And so it's a great opportunity to learn. It's also a great opportunity to ask questions, and it's also a great opportunity to share input and observations that you guys have seen as anglers in the field. Uh, so it's not just a pulse check and, and learning and listening, but it's also uh, a chance to interact directly. It's a unique opportunity to interact directly with a variety of, of researchers and managers. And it's a networking opportunity, right? A chance to have a, a nice conversation as we move through the evening. So I'll try to moderate us. We have lots of presentations. I'll try to keep us on track, but we'll also try to leave some space for uh, some conversation in, 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 the, in, in the cracks. So I want to thank in advance as the evening gets long. It's hard to say thank yous all at the end, so I want to, I want to do my thank yous at the front. Uh, this is uh, uh, this effort, this, these workshops are truly a collaborative uh, effort. There are a lot of folks from a lot of agencies, uh, a lot of local partners that have worked very hard to, to bring this workshop together. Uh, and I want to thank particularly our researchers and managers. You could call this a DNR workshop, and it is. You could call it a Sea Grant workshop, and it is. You could call it a US G uh, USGS Great Lakes Science Center workshop, and it is. You could call it a Michigan State University Department of Fisheries Wildlife Workshop, and it is. There's a lot of research and management agencies that are contributing content tonight, and you'll hear from them as we go through the evening. Could not do this workshop without the content that they've prepared to share. Uh, a lot of information summarized in just to, uh, into just a few hours. In terms of our community partners, uh, the Saginaw Bay Walleye Club has been amazing in helping us get this workshop in the Saginaw Bay area off the ground and making sure that people show up. Uh, getting the word out so folks can take advantage of a great educational uh, evening. Uh, the tribes in this facility, this is an amazing facility. I'm excited to, to be here and appreciate them having us. They've uh, uh, opened the space to us at no cost, allowing us to have this workshop uh, free and, and open to the public. And then other organizations like the Michigan Charter Boat Association, uh, the Michigan Steelheaders, a lot of other sport fishing groups that have contributed along the way. Uh, and, and in particular, I wanted to introduce Frank Christ, the DNR has uh, Lake Huron Citizen Fishery Advisory Committee, and I look at their advisory committee as my advisory committee. That advisory committee meets several times throughout the year, and I, that committee really helps me think about what do we want to share and what do we want to ask of folks that come together for these spring workshops every year. So Frank, Frank is the chair. Thank, thank you, Brandon. The Lake Huron Citizen Advisory Committee, I know some of you know this because I attend all these meetings each year, but we're a, a group of concerned citizens that are interested in the Lake Huron fishery. We have port representatives and representatives from organization all, all across the state. What's really interesting is we meet at least four times a year with the DNR, biologists, managers, others on the staff, but we also meet, just like Brandon said, uh, regularly with representatives from the uh, United States Geological Great Lakes Science Center, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, United States Department of Agriculture Wildlife Services. We have uh, uh, representatives from the uh, Michigan State University, Lake State University, on and on and on, and it's really, gives us an opportunity to see the best 
information that's being done on the lakes, and then we recommend to the DNR uh, various management options. What I really like to do, because Teresa and I, my wife, we go to all the uh, workshops, is to hear your input after the presentations. We're always interested in what the people at the very locations along the lake are interested. And we're especially work closely with Brandon C. Grant. He helps us to bring this information out to you, the public. Thank you, Brandon. So thanks, Frank. And again, this is a conversation. So we're taking notes from information you share in our direction, and we'll, we'll share that back with those advisors, uh, as, as Frank said. And then, of course, you, you guys are all partners. You show up, uh, took an evening out of your night. We don't have this workshop if you guys don't show up, right? So we appreciate you finding value in this and coming to participate as a part of the conversation. And for folks that haven't made it this evening, I wanted to thank some of our media partners, uh, in, in particular Bay uh, TV, who's, who's uh, recording this evening and, and going to rebroadcast rebroadcast and share uh, the information tonight with folks that weren't able to, to make the conversation tonight. So with that, I'm going to get us started. Again, you don't want to listen to me talk all night. Uh, there's a couple logistical housekeeping things. Bathrooms are most important, are just outside of the door. We will have a brief break, but make yourself at home if you need to use the restrooms, get a drink of water, step, feel free to step out to the back. Uh, there is a sign-in sheet that I will pass uh, along the tables as the evening progresses. Please sign in. Uh, the only time I'm using that information is to send you a workshop reminder either by email or US mail next year. Hopefully some of you got that uh, this year. Uh, there were a couple handouts in the back. One is a civil rights uh, uh, form and the other is an evaluation uh, that I'll reference a couple times throughout the evening. I hope you pick them up. If you need a pencil, there's some extra uh, golf pencils in the back you can use for a golf game after you're done. Uh, but the civil rights compliance, that is really just us uh, saying, because we're taxpayer funded, we want to make sure that everything we do uh, through MSU Extension is open to everybody and anybody for any reason whatsoever. And we make an honest effort to make sure our, our educational materials are out there uh, as publicly as possible. And so that's just um, the government's way of making sure we're, we're doing our, our own Honest, honest best to get that done. So if you would uh, fill in some of that demographic information, totally voluntary, but we would certainly appreciate it. Uh, the evaluation, we would certainly appreciate too. That's kind of a reflection of, of, of how we'll think about improving these workshops next year. Uh, there's a front page to the back page to that. Uh, you'll, you'll get to do the front page before the break and the back page at the end of the meeting. I'll explain as we go through. So with that, um, I'm going to kick us off and I'd like to start. So. Uh, the first thing I learned in fishery science 101, I start every workshop like this, I think, but is, is big fish eat little fish. So I'm out uh, fishing for walleye, but in order to have amazing, awesome walleye, I have to know that those walleye have little fish to eat. Uh, you know, that's part of that food chain thing we all learned about in grade school. And so what I wanted to do before we got to the perch and walleye conversations of the evening is to start with the prey uh, fish community. And I wanted to introduce uh, Andrew Briggs. Uh, oh, here's Andrew. And Andrew is with the Department of Natural Resources uh, uh, Fisheries Division, and he's with their research unit and has done a lot of the work in Saginaw Bay uh, to look at the little, little guys running around trying not to get eaten by uh, perch and walleye. So with that, Andrew. Thank you. All right, thank you. Can everybody hear me all right? Cool. So my name is Andrew Briggs. I'm a relatively new fish biologist with Michigan DNR. Started this last August. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you guys about what we've been seeing in our Saginaw Bay trawl surveys. Uh, so I'm going to summarize what we saw in 2017 and then uh, compare that to what we've seen historically since our surveys began back in 1970. So our survey is part of a larger uh, collaborative project that's known as, or we refer to it as the Federal Aid Study 466. Uh, and the objective of this study is to assess responses of the Saginaw Bay fish community to changing environmental and biological conditions. Um, of special interest is to monitor uh, the response of the fish community to management actions and management species, or in non-native species. Uh, so besides our trawl survey, there's also a gillnet survey, which our Alpina uh, office, uh, they uh, lead that. And also we get a lot of assistance from our uh, Southern Lake Huron management unit to complete our survey. So, as mentioned, we use trawling gear, and this gear, as you can see here, surveys uh, the bottom zone of the water column, so we're targeting these benthic species. Uh, however, we do catch some pelagic species when we deploy and retrieve the gear, so even though it's not targeting those species, we do have an opportunity to see uh, kind of what's going on with those species as well. 
One issue with using these trawls is that debris can be an issue, uh, like rocks and large logs. So if we uh, get hung up on one of these logs or rocks, we have to uh, stop our trawl and go back, retrieve it, uh, then start over. And we've been using our trawls since uh, the survey began back in 1970. So what I got here is our 2015 fall trawl locations. And I'm showing you 2015 just because in 2016 our uh, distribution of our sites changed. So you can see overall we have uh, Saginaw Bay divided into uh, four quadrants and we sampled at two sites per quadrant. So you, see, can we get, you can see we have two sites in the 100s, two in the 200s, two in the 300s, and two in the 400s. Uh, and at each one of these sites we did three trawls. Uh, but we decided we wanted to get better spatial coverage in the bay. So in 2016, uh, we increased the amount of sites, so now we're sampling at six locations within each, within each quadrant, but only doing one tow. So we're doing the same amount of total tows, 24, but we're getting better spatial coverage. Getting into our data, uh, here's our water temperature trends we've seen over time. Uh, you can see in 2017, we were above uh, our average water temperature that we've been seeing since 1987. And in 14 of the last 16 years, which is this this red box here, we've had seen water temperatures uh, over the average. And we have a similar trend with our water clarity. We use a Secchi disk to um, measure water clarity out in Saginaw Bay. Uh, what this is, if you haven't seen one, it's a black and white disk. We lower that into the water until we can no longer see it and then record at which step that occurred. And it's a similar trend. You can see, uh, again, 2017, we're above our long-term average. And in 10 of the last 11 years, we've been uh, over this, this average. And a lot of this may have to do with uh, the quagga and zebra mussels, which have invaded uh, the Great Lakes. Getting into our species composition, in uh, 2017, you can see mimic shiners, trout perch, and yellow perch made up the majority of our trout catch. Uh, this is a little different from 2016. Uh, last year, we had trout perch and mimic shiner. They just switched place from 2016 to 17. But in 2016, white perch were one of the uh, major species that we caught. And you can see this year, white perch were only 3% of our total catch. Also, our total catch, uh, the total number went down a little bit from 2016. See, last year it was 38,000. This year, a little bit over 29,000. One thing we do with our forage is we uh, created a forage index. And with this, there's 11 species that we include in our forage, forage index, which are uh, shown right here. They're L-wife. Emerald Shiner, Gizzard Shad, Rainbow Smelt, Spot Tail Shiner, Round Goby, Trout Perch, Age Zero White Bass, Age Zero White Perch, and eight, or Age Zero Yellow Perch and Mimic Shiners. Uh, and you can see that recently we've had a decline in our forage index, uh, but there was a little jump in 2015 and 16, but then it declined again in 2017. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through all of, our, all of our forage species individually so you can get a better idea of what's uh, what's going on with these species. I'm going to start with our soft grade benthic forage species. Uh, we get our spot tail shiners, trout perch, round goby, and mimic shiner. Starting with spot tail shiner, you can see that historically this was a pretty common species that we'd, we'd encounter. However, in recent years it's really dropped off, particularly the last four years. Uh, this last year we did see a slight increase from 2016, but it's still well below our long-term average of over, 500, over 400 fish per trawl, and we're at about 27 fish per trawl currently. Looking at trout perch, you can see, especially in recent years, we've been catching these pretty commonly. Uh, we did see a decently sized decrease this last field season. Uh, however, it's still above the long-term average. Round goby, these were first encountered in our trawls back in 1999, right here. Uh, and they've been pretty, pretty high ever since then. Uh, this year we saw a slight decrease, uh, but this is uh, uh, the slight decrease and it's a, uh, above the long-term average still. But if you only look at the years since they've appeared in our trawls, so from 1999 on, uh, that's below the average by quite a bit. So the long-term average since they've appeared is about 212 fish. Uh, this year we caught 108. Moving on to Mimic Shiner. Uh, this is another species that we're seeing more commonly now. Uh, this year we had a slight decrease from 2016, but overall it's above the long-term average. So now I'm going to move on to our, the pelagic species. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, these are species that we don't, um, that our trawl gear isn't the best at of a, uh, measuring abundance. However, we can get an idea of what's going on with these species. 
So I'm going to talk about uh, Gizzard Shad, Alewife, uh, Rainbow Smelt, and Emerald Shiner. Starting with Rainbow Smelt, uh, this is a species, again, that we've seen uh, very common in our historic catches, but recent years it's really dropped off. You can see 2016 and 17 especially, it's very low. Uh, and our catch rates this year were very similar to last year in 2016, uh, but it's well below the long-term average of 236 per tow. Alewife, uh, this is a species that really collapsed in 2003, and ever since then they've been virtually absent since our, from our trawls. Uh, this year we did see an increase in our trawl catch of Alewife. We captured one instead of zero. So I don't know if you want to call it a comeback, but there's, there was one fish there. Moving on to gizzard shad, uh, we catch these fairly regularly and at a pretty consistent catch rate. Uh, these are a very important species for uh, walleye. Uh, their walleye tend to prey on uh, gizzard shad. Uh, this year we saw a nice increase in our gizzard shad catch, uh, more than double than it was above the long-term uh, average. Emerald shiner, uh, this is an important species for uh, the bait fish industry. Uh, we saw an increase in those as well this year, uh, increased from three per trawl in 2016 to 16 uh, this last field season, which is just above our long-term average. Lastly, I'm going to talk about our spiny rayed forage species. So we got uh, white perch and yellow perch. Starting with yellow perch, uh, in 2017 we saw a slight increase uh, from uh, about 115 per tow to 158. Uh, however, this is below our long-term average. But one thing you'll notice is we have this, this huge peak here in 2003. And if you were to remove that, that year as an outlier, we're actually above the long-term average. Uh, so without that year, the long-term average, average would be 125, and this year we captured 158. White perch, uh, this is one that we've uh, seen since the mid to late 1980s, uh, and really this year we saw a big decline in our, yellow, or in our white perch catch, and this is a big reason why we saw a decrease in our forage index that we uh, saw this year. So last year we caught about 350 per tow, and this year only 35, and this is well below the long-term average. So just to give you guys a summary, I'm going to go through all the species and uh, look at their change from 2016 and then compare it to the long-term average. So a spot tail shiner, they uh, increase from last year, but it's overall well below the, the long-term average. That's why we've got double arrows here for well below. Uh, trout perch. Uh, declined quite a bit in 2016, but still above that long-term average. Round goby went down from 2016 and uh, is well below what we've seen since we, uh, they invaded in 1999. Uh, Mimic shiner, uh, they went down this year, but went up compared to the long-term average or above the long-term average. Both rainbow smelt and alewife, they were about the same as last year, but are well below their long-term averages. Gizzard shad and emerald shiner, both uh, went up from 2016 and are both above the long-term average. Young of Year Yellow Perch, they went up from 2016, but were below the long-term average. And then White Perch uh, went down quite a bit in 2016 and were well below the long-term average. So about half of our species went up in 2017 uh, compared to 16. About half went down, but White Perch went down a lot, which is a big reason for the decline in that forage index. And one interesting thing to note about uh, how our species compared to long-term averages is a lot of these species that uh, are drastically below the long-term average are actually non-native species. So we got white perch, which are non-native, are well below, alewife are well below, which are non-native, rainbow smelt are well below, and round goby are well below. And that is all I have, but I think I got time for questions, so if anybody's got any, I can take those now. What, uh, what month of the year do you get? We do our surveys in September. Usually the first couple weeks of September. And why have you selected that particular one? So I can't say why we first selected, but it's just when we've done it historically since 1970. We're doing it at the same time, so our data is comparable over time. Would you think that if you did this type of trawl system in a different month, it would be different? Absolutely, yep, yep. Do you think water temperature increases in the bay are impacting the troll? It's definitely possible that it's impacting maybe uh, fish may be spawning at different times or affecting survival, stuff like that. Or pushing offshore. Yep. Yep. It's possible. How 
noise of the fleas affecting them. Can you repeat that? The fleas from the lake. Uh, I'm like that is a bad affecting the small fish. Oh, the spiny water flea? Yes. So there are so the, we're not I'm not really sure what the, the prey for the forage is like out there, but I mean it's it's possible. I know uh, Drexin and mussels have really filtered the water out and that's impacting what's available to to the fish. But as far as specifically the spiny water flea, I'm not sure how they're affecting it. Oh, I dive and uh, I'm up here all the time. There seems to be like a green slime on the bottom since the quagga mussels clean really clean in the water. Yep. Do you think that's affecting the bait fish at all? Or? I'm not sure. I can, can answer that. It's a good question though. Of white suckers? White suckers? Uh, we see those in our trawls a little bit, but I'm not sure. I mean, we don't catch a ton of them, but I'm not sure what would have happened to them overall. What about the Asian carp? Do you see any of those? We do not catch any Asian carp in our, in our trawls, no. Cool. Thank you. Well, I'm going to say thank you to Andrew for getting us off to a great start and a nice golf clap for him. So, so in, in the, fun, the fun part, I think, of how we've uh, flow, flowed the agenda here is, that, is you kind of wondered, like, okay, where are all those little fish? Uh, uh, whose stomachs are they ending up in? And so I wanted to introduce uh, Katie Kendr Kend Kendra Kendrzynski. Oh, so close. Yeah, Katie is, is uh, uh, from our Michigan State University Department of Fisheries and Wildlife, and Katie is working uh, with Michigan Sea Grant and, and the department down there in the USGS Great Lakes Science Center uh, to manage uh, uh, a two-lake-wide, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron predator diet study. And the neat thing about that is that's a citizen science opportunity for us as anglers to contribute uh, data by collecting the stomachs out of, out of the predators that we harvest and passing them along to Katie uh, for a analysis and all kinds of great information that she can then share back with us about food webs and food web interactions. So with that, I'm going to queue up your presentation and I'd like to introduce Katie. Thank you, Brandon. Can everybody hear me? Okay. So as Brandon said, uh, my name is Katie Kurczynski. I'm a math first year master's student at Michigan State um, and I am doing the Lake Huron side of the predator diet study. All right, so the objectives of this study are first and foremost to investigate the changes in the predator-prey relationships since the last study that was done between 2009 and 2011. So some of the specific things we want to look at are lake-wide have Chinook salmon changed their diet from alewife and rainbow smelt, which they have historically kept. Um, have, how have round goby been incorporated into the food webs? We want to see if they're in more of the stomachs than they were in the past. Um, one of the things we're going to be doing with this data is pro helping uh, provide it or provide proportions of diets for bio, and of the DNR's bioenergetics model so they can estimate consumption. Um, and we'd also like to compare angler caught lake trout diets to some of the lake trout diets from some of the DNRs and USGS surveys. Um, so for today's presentation, um, we're not going to be looking at the angler caught versus um, survey caught stomachs at all. Um, I'll just be showing you guys the angler diet. Um, so when we collect stomachs, we're using a lot of citizen science, um, so volunteer anglers have been helping us bring in a lot of stomachs. Um, so we get the network set up at last year's Sea Grant workshops, and we're hoping to continue expanding that network this year. Um, so we'll actually have some collection kits to provide you with uh, at the break, um, but I can tell you more about those later. Um, we've got a couple of centralized freezer location or collection points. So there's um, freezers for you to drop off stomachs. We'll be attending various tournaments uh, all throughout the summer so that we can collect more. Um, the DNR creel clerks and the fish and wildlife headhunters will be collecting stomachs. Um, and we will also be uh, going to a couple of the high traffic 
uh, cleaning station such as the one in Linwood um, to grab more stomachs. So we're trying to collect as many as we can. Um, and when we get them and we bring them back into the lab, um, we start off by identifying the fish con or the prey fish. Um, so we identify them the species. It's not always easy as you can see. They get pretty decomposed and you can't identify them just on site a lot of the time. So we use the clythra, which is a bone that connects the pectoral fin to the rest of the body. Um, and we'll use otoliths, which are the fish ear bones. And so that's what we use a lot of the time to identify them. Um, in terms of invertebrates, we identify them to order. So like just as far as mayfly, we don't necessarily go into the specific kind of mayfly. Um, and as far as the data we collect on each of these diet items, we look at the total length, the standard length, or the backbone length, depending on how much of the fish is left. Um, and we also get the wet mass and the dry mass. Um, so I've got some of the preliminary results from last summer. Um, we've looked at almost 700 diets out of the 1,200 plus that we collected. Out of those, 40% have been empty, um, but we were able to get stomachs from all the way up in Detour um, and all the as far south as Harbor Beach are the ones we've looked at so far. Um, and so for some of the results, I'm going to be calling these ones um, up here are going to be the northern Lake Huron from Lighthouse Park and Harbor Beach are going to be southern Lake Huron. And then the ones we've collected from Linwood, I'm going to label as Saginaw Bay. So for Northern Lake Huron, we've had 43 Chinook, 157 lake trout, and 22 walleye for a total of 222 fish that we've looked at so far. Um, from Southern Lake Huron, we've had 22 lake trout and seven walleye, so only a total of 29. Um, and from Saginaw Bay, we've had 390 walleye, all from Linwood. Um, so again, these are not all of the fish that we have. They're not all of the locations. These are just what we've processed so far. Um, in terms of a number of diet items, or number of kinds of diet items we found, um, we found seven different items in Chinook, 18 in lake trout, and 23 in walleye. So a total of 27 different prey items that we have identified um, overall so far. So here are some of the prey proportions by wet mass. Um, so in northern Lake Huron, Lake um, Chinook have had over 60% of alewife in their guts, um, and they've had right around 20% of rainbow smelt. Lake trout have been primarily round goby. Um, we have seen a lot of round goby in those lake trout, um, as well as quite a few rainbow smelt. Walleye have been about half round goby and about half other fish, and those have been a lot of uh, corrigonids, so like bloaters. Um, and then we get to southern Lake Huron. It's been primarily bithytrephes and mayfly in the lake trout, but I'm pretty sure most of those have been empty. Um, in terms of walleye from the south, we've had a lot of round goby over there. And then walleye in Saginaw Bay have a completely different diet from the rest of the basin, or from the rest of the lake. And we've seen a lot of yellow perch, um, not very many round goby. I think we found one round goby in the Saginaw Bay walleye. Um, and we found quite a few mayflies and other invertebrates as well. Since we're here, um, questions at the end, please. Um, so since we're here at the Saginaw Bay workshop, I figured I'd split these up a little bit for you guys to see. Um, so we've got four months that we have data for for the Saginaw Bay walleye. Um, in June, you can see they primarily ate, oh, excuse me. In June, they were primarily eating invertebrates. Um, so those were mainly mayflies, hexagenia, um, but the primary fish they were eating was yellow perch. You get to July and their diet is over 70 percent yellow perch and that kind of stays throughout August and then at September it decreases a little bit on the yellow perch and increases with the gizzard shed. So we're seeing a little bit of a seasonal pattern here with the fish. Um, and since there's so many invertebrates that we've seen, especially in June and July, um, we broke those up as well. Um, and you can see in June there were a lot of mayflies. Uh, July that kind of switched to the spiny water flea. Um, in August that was also the spiny water flea with an increase in diptera, so a lot of uh, midges. 
And then in September, there weren't very many invertebrates, so there's a lot of just kind of terrestrial uh, bugs that we saw. Um, so we also compared the data from 2017 to the data from the previous study for Saginaw Bay. Um, so you can see that we've got pretty close to the same amount of perch as we found in the previous, in 2009 and 2010. 2011 was a little bit of an anomaly, but um, it's pretty similar to the two years before that. Um, two of the big differences between 2017 and 2009 through 2011 um, or we didn't find any round goby, um, or we found the one where you see in 2009 they still had about 20% round goby. In 2010 it was about 10%, but we found very few round goby this year. Um, and then the other big difference was the increase in invertebrates. So you can see we've got about 20% invertebrates here in 2017, and the most they had was like 5 to 7% previously. So some of our preliminary conclusions, um, Chinook are still eating alewife and rainbow smelt, so that's kind of what we expected. Um, lake trout are eating a lot of round goby, um, it's quite a few more than there were in the previous study. Um, in Saginaw Bay, walleye are eating a lot of yellow perch. Um, there are some seasonal patterns that we want to look more into. Um, and there are more invertebrates present in the Saginaw Bay walleye than we were in the study previously. Um, and we think that might potentially be due to the lower size limit, so going from 15 inches down to 13 could have been uh, the reason for that. So with that, we'll go into the 2018 collections, which we are starting now. Um, and we're relying on you guys and other anglers to provide a lot of our data. So. Um, We've got kind of a little instructional thing here to, for us to tell you, um, to help us get the data we need. Um, so when you catch a fish and you're helping to donate the stomach, um, we would appreciate it if you could cut just behind the gills um, and make sure you get the stomach and then cut it um, after the intestine, at the, or in the middle of the intestine there. Um, and then we've got bags. Um, so we put the stomach in the bag, um, and then we have these tags that go with it. Um, so we'll, we'd like you to put the date caught, the port you fished, the species, the length to a quarter, to the nearest quarter inch. Um, and when we're doing the length, we'd like you to get from the nose all the way to the end of the pinched tail. Um, mark down if the adipose fin was clipped or not, if you have a trout or a salmon. Um, and then the depth of the water would be useful as well. Um, the tags we have this year do have some information on the back um, about if you forget any of this or if you want to see more information, we've got um, some instructions on the back and there's more data tags and an instructional video on how to take the stomach out on the website that's there at the bottom. Um, we do have a Facebook page. Um, so if you're interested in seeing pictures of what we're seeing or a few updates, um, feel free to follow that. Um, and with that, we've got bags at the back of the room that we'll hand out at the break. Um, they're going to have some tags, and then we'll have additional bags for you. Make sure you put your stomachs in the bag, not your fillets. Um, <laughs> with that, <laughs> I mean, I would like them, yes, but for the study, we need the stomachs. Um, but with that, we'd like to thank everybody, um, the anglers for helping provide the stomachs, and the sport fishing clubs, the creel clerks. Um, tournament organizers and boat ramp fish cleaning stations for access to the fish, um, USGS, GLC, or GLSC, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the many lab techs we've got, um, the DNR, um, and then USGS Sioux for funding as well as the Saginaw Bay Wildlife Club. Um, with that, I'll take any questions. When you clench the fish tail to measure him, mm -hmm. Uh, you can't use that as a legal length. I believe that is. Yeah, that's the legal length. That's the legal length. Yep. Oh, yep, that's the total length. Yep. So if you had that in your, if you had that in your creel, it would be a legal length. Yes. Okay. As long as it's 13 inches. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. My question was, do you feel? Um, you know, like Saginaw Bay walleye was different than 
other areas of the Great Lakes as far as what the walleye were eating more heavily on fruit. Do you think it's a matter of availability or preference? You know what? Do you think their feeding patterns are, you know, what's available or preference? What's your thoughts there? Um, right now, I'm thinking it's what's available. Um, I've got to do some more analysis and look at the prey base to be sure. Um, but compared, there's a very much, or there's a higher population of yellow perch here in Saginaw Bay, especially compared to the rest of the lake. Um, so I'm thinking it's what's available. Okay. Do any studies on perch in all three? I have not done any studies on perch, no. On these walleye, when you catch them, you got your live well, they're regurgitating their stomachs. So are you getting the results basically from the intestines or are we not getting a really true picture of what's going on on the walleyes that the fishermen are catching? When they're regurgitating, we don't necessarily have the full picture, um, but I think we are getting enough that aren't regurgitating where it'll make up for it. So there's no difference between what you are seeing that the fishermen are catching and what you guys are catching in some trawls. So that's, that's, that's one of the things we'll be looking at. I haven't looked at the trawl caught walleye yet, uh, but that is something we will look at. We haven't seen any crayfish, no. We haven't seen that. Um, it's been mostly perch. Give me a break. <laughs> She's got, he's got pictures. Other questions? I missed the last chart. Left chart? Yeah, was, uh, oh. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, we, they're not a primary subject of the study. Um, we've seen a couple come in from Linwood, but their stomachs have all been cut in half, so we haven't been able to look at them at all. Yeah, we've seen some fish with as many as over. A, we've had, we've we've seen lake trout with over a hundred fish in them. Um, so yeah, we see a lot. All right. Well, with that I appreciate the opportunity to ask some questions of Katie, and I want to thank her for her time putting this together and offering us this opportunity. So thank you. And, and I'll, I'll say, you know, I, this is one of the things we always try to bring to these workshops is opportunity, citizen science opportunities where we as anglers can contribute to the research and, and data collection that's out there. So Katie did mention uh, she has some collection kits that are in the back that she'll be handing out at the break. And this is where I'm, I'm going to steal your sheet here. This is where I'm going to reference the two-page evaluation. Sorry about that. I, I, I typed them in big fonts, so it's not like there's a lot of questions. but. The, the, the front page is the evaluation for the entire workshop. So as you get to the end of the workshop or the time when you have to leave, if you would fill that front page out, at the very least, I'd very much appreciate it. Uh, on the back page, there's a few questions about the Lake Huron Predator Diet Study. It actually says Lake Huron Predator Diet Study, a few questions. And it's just basically asking, did you know about the study before today? Have you participated in the past? And some reasons why you may or may not have participated. And really that's just helped Katie and the research team better think about how do we connect with anglers. One of the exciting things for me is they've made, the research team has made a commitment to bring the, the, those findings back to us, right? So if I'm, I'm an angler, you all look in the stomachs, right? I want to know what my fish are eating. Uh, this is a great opportunity to see a, a bigger picture of what a lot more fish uh, are eating beyond the creel and catch that we bring home in our own, own boat. So with that, uh, we appreciate the research team, uh, them sharing the research tonight and making that opportunity available to us. So moving us along, we're going to still think about little fish, but these little fish have the potential to get a little bit bigger. Cisco, and some of you would recognize Cisco, uh, they, they, uh, going by the name of, of Lake Herring. So it used to be called Lake Herring, now we just call them Cisco. Uh, and for a long time in Lake Huron, when Alewife collapsed, the conversation has been around this native species, Cisco, and how can we restore, potentially restore uh, Cisco populations in Lake Huron. We think they have a lot of uh, value as forage fish 
fish, we also think they have a lot of recreational and even potential commercial value. There's a lot of reasons why we would like to have this nati native species uh, uh, make a comeback in Lake Huron. Uh, so many agencies have been talking about this through the umbrella of the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission, but Steve Leonard is with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, made the trek down from Alpena, we appreciate that, and he's here to share an update and, and summary of the Cisco restoration work uh, in Lake Huron, but in the context of Saginaw Bay, which will be a major uh, factor in that lake-wide conversation. So with that, I'm going to introduce Steve, and I'll cue up your presentation. Well, uh, thank you, Brandon, and thank you folks for allowing me an opportunity to uh, um, provide an update. I'm going to call this an update, really, on and for folks who might have been at the Bay City Workshop last year, um, really it's, it's providing uh, some additional information that um, relates to uh, an initiative that, as Brandon indicated, uh, agencies and management agencies uh, on Lake Huron who uh, work under this umbrella of the Great Lakes Fishery Commission are embarking and that's a uh, reintroduction of Cisco and uh, also Brandon um, helped out by um, giving their former common name which is Lake Herring. So I'm actually going to start with a question of you. So how many of you have ever fished for Lake Herring? Oh, excellent. That's more hands than I would have expected. So, excellent. Cool. So, some of you have some uh, good familiarity with this uh, with this animal I'll be talking about. So, as I'm, I'm Steve Leonard, I'm with the Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm here as uh, really representing this uh, group of technical folks who have been working on this issue uh, actually for some time. Um, and so, this isn't a technical presentation, more of an update and kind of what we are uh, uh, embarking on and why Saginaw Bay is, is a big part of that. Okay, so a bit of, by way of outline, so I'll start by talking about Cisco, what they are and why we should uh, give a rip about them. Um, a little bit about goals and objectives. So this this is a study. So as as being a study, we are, we are laying out specific objectives that we want to evaluate. So we'll get a little bit into that, and then provide an update on um, how it's going on the culture side. So this is uh, kind of a new endeavor for the Fish and Wildlife Service, certainly, and bringing these animals into our hatchery system. So I'll provide a little bit of an update uh, on that and what that initial stocking plan uh, should look like. And then a little bit about the monitoring and evaluation. Um, and I think some of the previous, the previous two uh, presentations uh, provided some nice backdrop for that. Okay, so what are Cisco? Uh, there's uh, also known as, or formerly known as, uh, Lake Herring. Um, so they're they're in, re in a related group of fishes. Most of you are are familiar with some of their uh, close cousins. They include uh, Lake Whitefish, and as well as bloater, and as well as a, a group of of what we think of as the deep water chubs. The most of which are, uh, at least as a group, are no longer present in Lake Huron, but we still have kind of remnant stocks of those in, in Lake Superior. So it's a group of fishes that, uh, that all are in this same genus, uh, Corrigonus. Uh, so they were once the dominant prey species throughout the Great Lakes. Um, and so those populations pretty much across the Great Lakes crashed around the middle of the uh, 20th, 20th century in Lake Huron in Michigan, a little earlier in the lower lakes. Um, and they certainly, uh, Cisco populations declined in Lake Superior as well, but, uh, but they didn't, uh, uh, they've seen some uh, rehabilitation of those stocks and they, they remain self-sustaining in Lake Huron. Um, Various reasons cited for the decline. Um, much of uh, I don't want to really get into that part of it. And I, I'm actually Andrew kind of set the stage for me for a couple of terms that he introduced um, unwittingly because we didn't talk about this. So I have this term pelagic planktivore, um, and so 
You heard uh, Andrew introduce terms called benthic, that's kind of bottom feeding. Uh, pelagic really kind of means in the water column. So Cisco, um, we, we like boxes, so this is one box we kind of put them in as these uh, feeding in the, in the water column, uh, in the open waters. But they have a pretty diverse feeding ecology across the lakes if you look at different Cisco populations. But I think that's an important concept from in terms of the niches that are potentially available uh, to them. Uh, so what else about Cisco? They spawn in, uh, at least in, in, in many areas, uh, in nearshore waters in, in the fall. So they're a fall spawning species. Oh, don't want to do that. Okay, so a little bit about the reasons why we should consider a uh, restoration program for Cisco. Um, so it's most of these are about resiliency, uh, building some resiliency in, in the prey, prey base. You know it's a pretty diverse uh, prey base in Saginaw Bay, a lot of different bars on the graph there. If you looked out and expanded that to the, to the broader lake, it's a much less diverse system. We have some alewife left here and there, rainbow smelt, bloater, and really, by and large, that's about it. Supporting most of the most of the lake's predators outside outside of a place like Saginaw Bay. So, we think that Cisco really can provide, you know, hopefully provide, um, you know, additional resiliency. They they achieve a larger body size. Um, I think that was mentioned as well. Brandon might have even mentioned it. So. They can outgrow some of the, the predator, predation windows from at least the smaller predators, and that's an important concept because that means you can you know, potentially have a brood stock uh, that's, that's maintained. Uh, we think as a native species, Cisco are gonna be better adapted to, to local climate and, and environment. Uh, they have less interference with the reproductive, reproduction of native, native species. And there's also the aspect potential for fisheries. So those of you who have fished a little bit for Cisco, um, it's a bit of a niche fishery, perhaps, but uh, certainly that's a that's an added benefit. Uh, and, and you know, from a long-term perspective, that would be a fan, I think a pretty fantastic outcome. So that's a little bit about the why that we think um, uh, that embarking on Cisco restoration is is important. And the other aspect is why Saginaw Bay. So. Saginaw Bay was probably the uh, support the largest population of Cisco back historically. So I know some most of you cannot read this graph. Actually, I'm not even sure that I can. So I know you can't. Um, let's see if I can find the pointer here. All right. So this is just a graph that shows the estimated commercial yield. That's historical data. That's oftentimes what we have available to us. Uh, but it's a good indication, really, of the of the uh, of the the trends in in uh, in populations of, of some of these species that were fished commercially. So this is kind of the overall bars represent um, Cisco commercial Cisco yield from Lake Huron, and then the white part of the bars represents that proportion that is estimated to have come from Saginaw Bay. So a big part of the total lakewide yield uh, came from Saginaw Bay. So large spawning populations. You see in that, I mentioned in most of the lakes, those populations really collapsed by the, by the mid, mid 50s and it have remained low. So what else, what is it about Saginaw Bay? Um, probably the second bullet is, is one of the key uh, considerations uh, and that's the uh, habitat characteristics. We think there's good juvenile habitat. If, uh, if that remains, uh, then we think there's good opportunity for, for fish to survive and find resources. Um, the other good part about Saginaw Bay, and, and uh, a little bit of what Andrew went into, we do have routine monitoring uh, surveys that we can use for evaluation. So that's a, that's a bonus as well. Okay, so I mentioned this is a study, and as a guiding principle, essentially what we're, what 
what we're saying is that we need a stocking evaluation in order to uh, guide us future actions as it relates to Cisco restoration from, from a broader perspective. So we're, we're starting a little bit small, uh, kind of keeping our, our horizon a, a little bit uh, smaller now so we can learn, so we have an opportunity to, to learn about what strategies we might employ and, and monitoring uh, which, which are successful. So the goal is to see if whether we can really you know, establish a local stock of Cisco via stocking. Um, and in terms of uh, doing this on a, on a large scale, uh, not been done certainly recently, um, with at least with modern rearing techniques. So the focus is going to be on, on Saginaw Bay for the reasons I indicated, but a little bit of what we do know about Cisco and where they are, we certainly have Cisco in Lake Huron, um, and the circled areas here um, show really those areas where we have the most information probably, and this includes the St. Mary's River system into the North Channel, Lachino Islands, and that's probably where our best information is uh, on Cisco, um, probably one of the areas where they're, they're found in, in highest numbers. And then a place like Georgian Bay, we're beginning to, to learn a little bit more about Cisco populations there. Um, that doesn't mean Cisco are completely absent from the rest of the lake, but as a, as a, a meaningful part of the fish community, um, there's broad areas of the lake in which Cisco really um, are, are not part of that fish community. And so there are some important characteristics about Saginaw Bay in that it's it's isolated from what we um, or is spatially isolated from from, what, from stocks that we know about and so that has some benefit as well. Okay so in terms of objectives um, these are kind of the primary study objectives uh, that we want to uh, really evaluate and so uh, we want to see if first and foremost can we raise them? Can we rear them? Can we stock them? Do we have evidence they'll, that they'll survive, right? So, and so we want to evaluate their survival all the way to see if we, they can survive to maturity, so uh, to a reproductive uh, um, age. And so what the other part of that is, is we want to evaluate if they survive to maturity, can we detect them returning actually to the areas where we stock them? Is there, is there a homing mechanism uh, that we can take advantage of uh, to, to evaluate that part? And of course, you know, from a longer term perspective, we want to know is if they survive to maturity, if they, if they mate, do they produce progeny? And so that's, that's a, another element of the, the objectives. And, and then of course, Taking it a step further, do we have wild progeny that actually will then mate and produce um, Cisco? So those are kind of those are probably stepwise the evaluation components that uh, that uh, we're we're looking to evaluate. So how are we going to do this? Well, first and foremost, we need to stock fish in order to to evaluate uh, that. So it's. Currently designed as a 10-year evaluation, we had an initial target of about 750,000 fingerlings, um, and that was partly based um, on the, what we thought would be the, uh, the capacity uh, of the hatchery system, um, and so we're going to look at opportunities of whether those, uh, whether higher numbers would be either available or, or, uh, or actually something that would aid in, in the evaluation component. We're also looking at the potential to look at early and late late stage life stages, so kind of a spring fingerling versus a fall fingerling. And, and I've encircled kind of an area here that we think um, in terms of stocking locations. So we have an interest in really kind of integrating a variety of things as it relates to where we stock them. And that's, of course, preferred juvenile habitat, uh, the pr proximity to potential spawning habitat. Um, I say potential because 
We have some information uh, on the stocks in, north, in northern Lake Huron. Uh, we know a little bit about their spawning behavior. We know a, li we know a little bit about their, uh, the historical spawning sites in Saginaw Bay from published uh, reports. And so we're going to utilize that information to, to choose, hopefully wisely, uh, a, uh, an appropriate stocking location uh, and to the extent that we can somehow integrate what we know about predator densities to give them some opportunity to, to survive uh, as well. Of course, we want them to become forage. That's an important component. We just like them to survive a, a, a little bit um, before they become forage. So I, in, the, in the inset here is the Spencer F. Bear, that's a Fish and Wildlife Service uh, stocking vessel. So we anticipate using the Spencer Baird um, to do these stockings. So we anticipate this to be uh, kind of a, what you would think of as an offshore uh, or pelagic type stocking. Uh, and so all the Cisco will be chemically marked to allow identification as hatchery fish. So we're going to evaluate other marking techniques, but the, at least initially, um, we don't anticipate having visible marks. I did hear recently that our um, folks in our mass marking program are going to try to use, run Cisco through, the, through their um, uh, tagging machines, not to tag them, but at least to do an adipose clip. So for those of you who know, you, most of you are familiar then from fishing trout or salmon. Um, sometimes in the hatchery system, that's the fin, that's that fleshy fin at the, uh, on, the, on the dorsal uh, uh, surface toward the tail to see if we can actually do some sort of uh, physical mark uh, as well. But much to, be, much to learn as it relates to, uh, to, to uh, marking a Cisco. But uh, some techniques are well established. Um, OTC marking this is an example, of course. Uh, and you're likely familiar with that. So this is the, the, the broad approach. And then just a little bit about um, where do we get gametes. So the gametes that had served now uh, in the federal hatch hatchery system um, were from two locations, uh, Potaganesing Bay and the Lachino Islands. So we were able to um, find fish at both locations. And a little bit about the spawning, they, these animals tend to start aggregating in, in mid-October and then peak spawning is somewhere usually between mid to late November. Uh, most years it's gonna fall in a 10 day window that starts right around deer season. So it's a popular guy in my office, as you might guess. Um, so uh, in, oftentimes in that 10 day window, that's, that's, that's what the conditions look on the, on the boat. So um, it's, it's fun, it's interesting work, but it can it certainly be a challenge. But uh, we had good success um, this year, and just uh, these are just a, a series of maps that just show some, some of the locations where we were able to find spawning animals and, and collect them. Top map is the Lachino Islands, and then this would be Potaganesing Bay. So. Um, so let's talk about the culture update then. So um, what we've done thus far is we have two years where we collected wild gametes to use as, as in developing uh, captive brood stock. So that's another evaluation on kind of the hatchery end. Uh, we don't know um, how that will go and whether these animals can be spawned in, in, in captivity, whether they'll survive that spawning. So a lot still to learn, but we think, you know, Looking at development of a captive brood is something that, that we certainly uh, are, are uh, considering, um, certainly at least as a hedge, as a fallback. Um, but we've also, in 2017, collected the first um, gametes that are will actually used in production. So these are animals that will be stocked out. So that's the, we have over a million fry now at, at growing at our Jordan River um, National Fish Hatchery, so that's, uh, uh, located up here in Elmira, Michigan, and they've done some infrastructure development. So these are these animals are not lake trout, and that's a lot of what we have we've been pretty good at in the federal hatchery system. So this is this is new stuff, um, but so far so good. Um, we got about over a million fry. 
Uh, so these would represent a 2018 stocking cohort. So this year only, at least, we're only going to be able to do a fall fingerling um, type animal. So that would be sometime in late September, early October for release. But uh, we expect to have fish available this, this year for stocking. And just some, some pictures there. This is actually from our hatchery system. They wanted us to take a look at to see if these animals were actually feeding in the hatchery system and what, what they were eating. So uh, we've been looking at some of those elements as well. And then the final part is evaluation, and, and, and I'm including here coordination because it's kind of some of these meetings and be able to, to talk with folks is, is an important element of that. So the evaluation and how we look at whether we're meeting any of those objectives that we laid out it is really going to involve a lot of partnerships, uh, agencies that have long-term surveys, um, uh, so one of which uh, Andrew described today, that's the Saginaw Bay Fish Community Survey. Uh, we, uh, you know, of course, the management agencies are, are monitoring fisheries and, and both creel and commercial reporting. There are um, other fish community surveys in the main basin, some early life history monitoring, there are lakewide trawl surveys, looking at predator diets. So not all, not, these are not necessarily de designed to really um, index Cisco very well, but they are uh, long-standing and we think if we have reasonable survival that somewhere um, we're going to be able to see Cisco show up uh, in these surveys. Nonetheless, um, a couple of things that um, were uh, being uh, developed as part of the evaluation are some more targeted type surveys. Uh, Post-stocking survival surveys to get an earlier um, understanding of whether we're getting survival and then of course a fall spawning survey. So these are things that we're, we'll, we'll be working on and in, in implementing over the course of the study. Um, and then there's a, a lot of other type of projects that, that could result from this as well. This includes things like doing uh, movement and, and predation, uh, perhaps doing some telemetry work. I mean, most of you have seen some presentation on uh, telemetry um, with walleye, uh, Saginaw Bay. Certainly it's, that's been an important study for understanding uh, walleye dynamics. And so those are some of the other elements of the evaluation that we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do. And then, so just wanted to say special thanks to Dave Fielder. Uh, Dave's been, uh, uh, Dave and I have worked on a lot of this uh, together, and uh, just, uh, and it's, it's been a good partnership between, you know, our offices, but the other agencies from the Lake Huron Technical Committee. So um, I guess that was all I had. And Brandon, if we have time for questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Questions? Yes, sir. Do we know what they eat? And Problems with zebra mussels and the lack of a diaphragm and the food chain and everything for the yellowwise, for example. Yeah, I would guess there no no animal is going to be immune from that because it's really that's part of, partly about it, the energy in the system, right? And so we know that there's less energy in the system because it's a lot of it tied up. So they're not immune to it. However, we do also know from places, um, you know, there's Cisco populations in Lake Michigan, uh, of course, and they've they've uh, been expanding uh, there, and so. Um, we think there are opportunities based on the ecology of the lake for, for Cisco to, to thrive because they do have a different kind of feeding ecology from many of the um, uh, kind of established parts of, of the system. Lake Superior has a lower nutrient status and Cisco do well there. So, uh, you know, we think there's opportunity. We, we, we don't know, but they also have, uh, they have a pretty diverse feeding ecology. I mean, if any of you have fished for them. They make these uh, migratory um, feeding migrations near shore, feeding on mayflies and, and whatnot. So we think they, you know, there's a potential for them to kind of carve out their spot. So, but they're not going to be immune to that, that really that lower productivity overall in the system. Yes, sir. Yeah, you touched briefly on Georgian Bay, and I know that's a huge body of water and has a lot of similarities to our Saginaw Bay. Uh, my question is, are you working closely with the Canadian Fisheries Division, and do they have any parallel programs? Because I know what we do here affects them, and vice versa. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So um, we do. We do work pretty closely with uh, Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources. They are represented on that on this body of technical folks. And it's been interesting because I think as we've embarked on this, it's really as an agency, they've begun to look a little more closely about understanding. They have they've have well-established Cisco populations, which they probably didn't know a, a heck of a lot about. And that's been one of the things that I think has occurred over the last couple of years is, is really a, a, a greater, trying to uh, understand our, our existing stocks and, and we've been able to do to do that, so that's a, that's a, a, a good observation. But so, yeah, I mean, we're, it's it's getting there. There's still work to be done, certainly. Yeah. Yes, sir. Are you aware of any uh, stock surveys that have Cisco's and Shiba stocks? I'm not. Um, I'm looking, maybe Dave. In uh, Lake Superior, uh, they don't have a lot of shrimp salmon, but they will consume uh, lake herring there, usually juveniles. But yes, uh, Chinook will eat Cisco. Is that is that what the is that what this the Cisco's are based on is for feed for Chinook or, or just partly feed in potentially in that they could provide food for our pelagic predators like those also lake trout, um, walleyes will uh, eat them, but they also provide a fishery. They can be a lot of fun to catch and, and consume for you know, recreational fisheries, and they have a potential as a commercial species. So there's a lot of good reasons for wanting to see. Cisco restored, not only the prey fish and diversify the prey base, but also to create fisheries and then also to create a predation buffer that might benefit yellow perch survival. And I'll talk about that later. Yeah. I think this gentleman here, I'll go to him first. How worried are you about the commercial fishing in the Saginaw Bay affecting the adults for the reproduction? So if we're fortunate enough to get these animals to a mature stage, to survival, and I would say we're going to look at the commercial fishery as, as just another opportunity for evaluation. So if we get to that stage where we're actually concerned about adults and we're looking at, I mean, that's a that's a, a an issue that um, you know is would be much farther down the road. I, I think we'll want to know if we have if these animals uh, are surviving and where where we might be able to find them. So we're going to need the cooperation of that community, I think, if we're going to be able to evaluate it. So, yeah, it doesn't. Uh, it's not a concern of mine now. Um, it's we're we're at the very early stages of, of of an evaluation. So the more information we have on that evaluation, I, I think the better. So, I think there was a gentleman in. Yes, yes, sir. To attribute the uh, collapse to to begin with. Well, I think there's a variety of uh, of reasons have been cited. The two most common would be, you know, kind of the, the same thing we often hear, which is over exploitation, but also com competition with, with invasive species. So right around that time, you had, of course, Rainbow Spelt were actually in the system earlier, um, you know, and they, they're they may have a, a stronger interaction, negative interaction with Cisco than but Alewife, and so um, those are the primary thoughts. There, of course, in certain areas, you might think of things like water quality as well, but uh, those are usually cited as some of the primary, the two primary uh, reasons why. I don't know if I'll come back to you. I'm not sure who had their hand up next. I apologize if I'm skipping over you. Let's let's go with this gentleman. I think he had. There's actually small commercial fisheries in in actually uh, in 1836 waters. There there are the Cisco are a, a permissible species. Uh, there's not much of a fishery for them. Um, and then I'm guessing that in the in the Ontario waters, there's also um, some opportunity. But again, they're not a target species uh, ex in Lake Huron, primarily. Certainly in Western Lake Superior, they are. How large do they get? Well, um, they get. Fairly, they can get fairly large. I think on average, you know, a 14-inch fish is, is probably a good-sized adult. You certainly can find fish up to, you know, 18 plus inches. And then if you're grad Traverse Bay, that's a completely different thing because they get very large over there. This gentleman all the way in the back. Do they migrate? Are they whole bodies? Or they have 
Yeah, that's a that's that's about that's the million dollar question. Actually, I think uh, somebody in, and I, I don't know if it was Dave or, or otherwise I, I hear the term like coastal migrant, right? And I think that's our best information that we kind of know about them. And if you talk to the folks who fish them up on the North Shore, that they talk about these feeding migrations that move along the shoreline, bay to bay, uh, and so that's maybe one element of of their ecology. Um, the other element of their ecology, what we'd like to see, is expansion into that pelagic zone, right? So that's there's a niche out there uh, that we would love to see Cisco be able to fill. So that's one of the things we certainly want to understand is what is their behavior um, in in uh, in the system. We know we know some something about their behavior based on the endemic stocks, but uh, that's going to be an important element. Dave has a comment. I would add that that's part of the experiment. This is an experiment that we don't know some of these things and that's part of what we're trying to learn. And we'll have monitoring out in the main basin with some of our partners that will be sampling out there as well as near shore. And the question about what, you know, do they have food resources, that's part of the experiment too. To see what they can do once they are back in these waters to, to see if they can carve out a niche for themselves and feed on what our existing you know, forage is for them. Yeah. Yeah. One more question. yeah, one more question I understand. I don't know who had their hand up first. Okay. Um, let me at that stage. How do you do the sampling? How do we do the sampling? We actually collect them with with gill nets in the fall, that's how we collect them. But in terms of being able to monitor them as adults, we have a variety of gears because they are pelagic, so they're in the water column. So things like midwater trawls, suspended type gear are the types of gears that work pretty well. In a shallower system like like Saginaw Bay, I, I think you'd have, because some of the gears, even the, the benthic gears, are going to cover a fair amount of the water column. So I think you'd have some ability to detect them with some of the traditional gears. But it is an issue. Uh, because our surveys aren't necessarily designed for these animals that spend the majority of their time um, in the pelagic zone. So it's a good question, though. So. Yeah, I, I've never seen what are the identifying characteristics. Oh, that's a great question. Good question. So, um, and I don't know if we have if we have time, we can get into this later. So, I mean, they're they're a, a silvery fish. If you're familiar with whitefish, it's in the in the same family. So you're going to see an adipose fin. Uh, that they have, but they're not likely to be mistaken for most other species except at a small size. They're going to look like whitefish, bloat, or any of the choragonids in that family can be hard to distinguish at small size. Unlike, unlike whitefish, though, they have a different shape to their body, so the deepest part of their body tends to be just in front of the dorsal <laughs> fin, but one of the best characteristics is its mouth, right? So. Um, the mouth, I, kinda, I know you can't see this, but I, I think that whitefish have a bit of an overbite, right? Cisco have, um, their mouths are about even, and then if you look at bloater, they almost have a little bit of an underbite. So it's that length of the lower jaw relative to the upper jaw is one of the characteristics, but so. Yeah. Well, I'm going to move us on to a break so I want to thank Steve. Uh, definitely a lot of interest and a lot of great information, a lot of great conversation. So thanks, Steve. So, so three hours goes fast, so a short evening gets a very short break. But I would like to offer an opportunity to stretch your legs. Again, there is so the, the diet study uh, 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 kits in the back with Katie. If you didn't get your question answered with Steve, we can grab him before he heads off at the break and, and just otherwise get up, stretch your legs, use the restroom. Uh, ten minutes maybe. Let's do eight and a half minutes and I'll kind of get us back together and we'll continue on with our evening. Uh, I did not introduce at the beginning because I knew she'd be here at halftime, uh, but I wanted to introduce, inter introduce our newest uh, Michigan Sea Grant Extension educator, Megan Goss. Uh, Megan is uh, serving the Saginaw Bay uh, region and she uh, literally has just started uh, but she is diving in head first and uh, she's been a great help uh, helping us to pull this uh, meeting together in terms of promotion and setting up getting us access to this awesome facility and so forth. So what I wanted to do is introduce Megan and let her talk about uh, Saginaw Bay Forage Fish Camp that she's working on uh, here this summer. Thank you Brandon. As Brandon mentioned, um, my name is Megan Goss and I recently started serving as a Michigan Sea Grant Extension Educator in the Saginaw Bay region. I 
started at the beginning of February, so I'm a little over two months into the position. And uh, with this position, I have two offices, one in uh, the Bay County Extension Office and then another in the Aranac County Extension Office in Standish. But I serve um, communities from Aranac all the way to Sanilac County and really, uh, would, I'm really excited to work with all of you to tackle issues like the Lake Huron fishery, but then also work with you on a variety of projects from invasive species to um, increasing preparedness for extreme storms and flooding. So thank you all for um, allowing me to serve uh, for you as a Sea Grant Extension educator. Um, today specifically, I'm here to speak about the Saginaw Bay 4-H Fish Camp. This is a fish camp that has been ongoing for many years and has many partners that are even here in this room, like the Saginaw Bay Walleye Club and um, the Saginaw Bay Wind. This is a great opportunity for eight to 12 year olds um, to learn about fishing. It's a four day camp where um, you, there's a small registration fee to um, sign up. It's uh, about $30 and then in exchange for participating, uh, youth get fish, rod, uh, real uh, tackle box, and they also uh, gain many ex fishing experiences. So in this year with the camp, we're expanding to also include some stewardship efforts. So uh, we're hoping to have the students uh, or 4-H members complete a monofilament recycling center at the Bay City State Recreation Area to ensure better stewardship for fishing in the future, and then also um, do a litter cleanup at the site, which will um, help the fishery as well. So this, these are the dates for the camp for this year. It is open um, to youth in Bay and Saginaw County. You do not have to be a 4-H member to sign up, um, but in exchange for signing up, you do get to become a 4-H member. So what a better gateway to joining 4-H uh, and learning more about MSU Extension. Uh, I have a sign up in the back of the room if you would like to get information about registering. Uh, once the event registration page is open, I will send you an email with the link and then more information about the fishing camp. But I just want to say thank you all again, um, and I look forward to partnering with all of you in the future to uh, tackle issues related to the Saginaw Bay. Thank you. So what I want to thank Megan and um, you know as you know uh, Michigan Sea Grant we cover a variety of issues that are related to the Great Lakes and so I feel like our, our, our work and role takes us all over the map but it, in short if you have a Great Lakes issue or a Great Lakes science issue or a Great Lakes uh, potential uh, uh, project opportunity uh, we'd like to serve and a lot of times we're hoping to collaborate with a lot of the partners uh, such as those in the room uh, here today and so uh, thank you Megan and uh, in terms of um, the, the getting youth involved, I mean, I think you guys would all think that's a no-brainer, right? Thinking about getting youth involved, the next generation of anglers. And I, I think I would share from my perspective, my graduate work, um, I, did, I worked with a professor at Michigan State and we did uh, some angler recruitment and retention studies working with the DNR fishing license sales uh, data. And I think we, we took the approach of looking at it at anglers as a stock of fish, right? And so I think if I showed you some of those graphs uh, that we developed in that project and changed the, the word angler to a fish, like walleye, and put that graph up, you guys would say, oh, holy cow, our walleye population is not looking very good in the future. Uh, it's, it's really looking like there's a lot of um, adult walleye out there, but not a lot of young walleye coming up in the population. What will we do in 40 or 50 years. And so I, I think that the, the effort that Megan is, is, is doing in collaboration with the community to uh, engage and recruit new anglers and, and connect them with the Great Lakes fishery is an important opportunity. I hope you'll uh, support and, and participate with her. So with that, I'm going to move us on. Uh, so we talked a lot about little fish and, 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 and little people. Uh, and so what I'd like to do is uh, move us on to the perch and walleye conversation. Uh, and Dave Fielder is uh, uh, from the research station in Alpena, the DNR Fisheries Research uh, Station. He's done a lot of the work in, in terms of the Saginaw uh, Bay uh, perch and walleye populations. You've heard from him in the past several years if you've attended these workshops in the past in terms of looking at not just um, the research behind those fish, but uh, engaging in that conversation about uh, uh, management of those fisheries. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave and let him take it away. Thank you, Brandon. And if you'll uh, bring up my presentation, uh, I'm going to um, be talking about a variety of different information sources to try to put together a kind of a holistic picture of what's yes, that's it, of what's going on with uh, the latest with walleye and yellow perch in the bay, 
and a number of different contributors to this work, even more than just what we see here. Um, let me remind you, first of all, that we departed from the statewide recreational fishery regulations of five fish per day and a 15-inch minimum length limit <clears throat> to something more liberal, and that was actually implemented back in October of 2015. But 2016 was our first full year, and this past year was our second full year of these liberalized regulations where we went to eight fish uh, for walleyes and a 13-inch minimum length limit. And I'll talk a little bit about <clears throat> why. And then for yellow perch, um, we're looking to uh, improve survival and increase abundance of yellow perch. And part of the strategy to achieve that was, in fact, these same liberalizations of, of walleye. Uh, but also, there was a relocation of one commercial fishing license out of Saginaw Bay, which would reduce, we hope, commercial harvest of, of yellow perch. And then, of course, the recreational daily bag limit was reduced from 50 to 25 for the bay. So um, those were the regulation changes. And a lot of what I'm going to show you is partly our attempt to see if we can measure the effects of these, what benefits have there been, and naturally we want to make sure that we're not going too far, potentially over harvesting with walleye. So that's a lot of what these slides are that I'm going to be showing you. So the goals were for uh, liberalizing the walleye recreational fishery regulations was to more fully utilize the walleye populations, of course, within the limits of sustainability, because the walleye uh, population, of course, achieved our recovery targets and was much more abundant than they were you know, previously. And then also to restore the yellow perch fishery to levels that were more consistent with the past performance. And I'll show you a number of slides towards the end um, about where the status of perch are today relative to where they were you know, back in the, say, the 80s or the 90s. And the strategy is to annually tailor the recreational fishing regulations to best achieve these goals and adapting to the newest information in a changing fish community. <clears throat> now, Oh, and um, the ability to do that, to have customized fisheries management like this in the Saginaw Bay is really a result of uh, information-rich monitoring, a lot of different kinds of surveys, uh, then, and that investment is a reflective of the importance of Saginaw Bay um, in the state of Michigan. So sort of the model for this is like what's been going on in Lake Erie for a long time. They have for a long time been tailoring, um, at least in the Michigan waters of Lake Erie, these different harvest regulation combinations of length limits and liberalized bag limits and sometimes open all year, sometimes closed seasons. And that's all being tailored to what the Lake Erie walleye population is doing. And so this is sort of the model that we have um, designed the Saginaw Bay um, walleye and perch management around in that we're striving for the same thing where we're going to wring the maximum performance out of these fish populations by adjusting the uh, regulations periodically. So this year, for example, we have been reflecting on all the different information that I'm about to show you, asking ourselves a question, do we need to change these regulations? Do we need to make them more, even more liberal or maybe make them more conservative? or maybe just leave them alone, and then we'll kind of conclude with that discussion. So where is the information sources that I'm going to be talking about? So Andrew talked earlier about the, the trawling survey that looks at the, what's going on with the, the, um, the prey fish, and also not just prey fish, but the juveniles of the game fish, like uh, young walleyes and young perch, are better represented in that trawling survey. And then we, at the same time that that's going on in early September, we are gill netting, uh, which allows us to sample larger, older walleye, larger, older perch, and other species, you know, northern pike and different things. And these two surveys complement each other really well, so we get a, com a very nice cross-section of what's going on with the, the fish community. And we've been doing that every year, pretty much the same way since 1970 for the, the trawling and since 1989 for the gill netting. Then there's the creel survey, which is a really important information source that helps us to understand how the fishery itself is performing. And no doubt many of you have been interviewed by a creel clerk at one time or another where they interview you at the, at the end of your fishing trip to find out how long you've been fishing for, what you were fishing, uh, targeting what you actually caught. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time and cooperating with those interviews. It's really important information. And this particular program is administered by Tracy Claremont, so she's another contributor to this whole 
information source here that we're presenting tonight. And then we have aerial flights that do the counting of the boats. So those boat counts and the interview information all goes into a computer program and cranks out these estimates of harvest and fishing participation. And I'm going to be showing you a lot of those slides. Then we have a walleye jaw tagging program too, and no doubt a lot of you have encountered a, a tag fish at one time or another. By returning those and reporting them, um, we are able to get measurements of mortality rates, how fast the fish population is declining in virtue of, of like harvest, that's the exploitation rate, a lot of the important metrics that we use to gauge the, uh, how intensely the fishery is operating, and we also learn a little bit about movement that way. Then there's a commercial reporting that's required, and we can see that's another look at certain um, um, uh, members of the fish community. Uh, there is a commercial fishery for yellow perch, so it's another look at yellow perch, what's going on there. And then, not in Saginaw Bay, but the Great Lakes Science Center, which is part of the USGS, does main basin prey fish surveys. And that helps us to understand what's going on out in the main basin. And there's connections to that, to Saginaw Bay, in terms of the presence or absence of ale lives, what's going on with rainbow smelt, other, whether Cisco's there or not. And so this is another source that we, of information that we look at. So I'm going to be kind of jumping back and forth between some of these different information sources, but I'll try to remind you as to what they are. I should also mention that one of our staff members, Tom Gagne, is the one that compiles his commercial reporting information, so he's another contributor to this information. Information. So this is the harvest of walleyes in Saginaw Bay as estimated by our creel survey uh, year round. So this is both the open water fishery and the ice fishery combined. And you can see how it fluctuated right around 100,000, maybe 150,000 for a long time. And then when um, reproductive success exploded in 2003 as part of that big food web change that took off, our numbers went way up. And, and then naturally the harvest reflected that. And then it came down to a more a higher but more intermediate level. And the newest value is 2017. So uh, what is that, about 200,000 walleyes roughly were harvested in um, Saginaw Bay. And this includes the Saginaw River and Titabalasi River um, yields as well. And, and so as we, we think about the liberalized harvest regulations, you might expect that that value is going to go up. And it did in 2017. The first year of, of, of the uh, liberalized regulations, it actually kind of stayed the same or went down a little bit. But I'll show you some information shortly that suggests that had those liberalized regulations not been in place, these values probably would have been much lower. So although it's not like creating a skyrocketing effect, it is shoring up the fishery, uh, harvest at least. Now that's harvest, and harvest is a function partly not only of how many fish are available, but also how much fishing activity is going on, fishing pressure or effort. We can factor that out by calculating the, the, the angler catch rate. So we take the harvest of walleyes and divide it by the number of hours of fishing that's going on, and that gives us, this is like 0.4 walleyes per hour or something like that. And now this may or may not reflect your personal experience in fishery, but fishing the bay, but when we plot this across all anglers out there, it gives us a pretty good indication of what's really going on in the fishery in terms of the quality of the fishing. So the higher the number, the faster you're catching walleyes, basically. And here you can really see the profound effect. So harvest was masked a little bit by trends in fishing participation that can be governed by the economy and weather patterns and things. This factors that out. And you can really see how the fishery has um, expanded and really improved um, in the bay since recovery of, of walleye. And in 2017, you can see that we experienced just about the highest angler catch rate that we've measured so far in this time series. Interestingly, this survey series started back in 83, which was really captured or reflected the period before even fingerling stocking was beginning to have an effect. So we almost captured and reflected the pre management era, if you will. So it's really neat that we can see that we've gone from almost zero up to a very high angler catch rate. We don't have a specific target worked out for angler catch rate in Lake Huron, but they do for Lake Erie. And it's a different, slightly different metric because now we're only looking at those anglers that say, I'm specifically fishing for walleye. Because previously that angler catch rate was also reflecting somebody that maybe was only fishing for bass or something. So it's a little bit diluted. This is a little bit more specific metric. 
In Lake Erie, they have a management target of 0.4 walleyes per hour. They want to try to stay at or above that. So it's a useful benchmark for us to look at as well. This is just like the, the Saginaw Bay data, though, relative to that benchmark. And you can see we've been right around or well above it in many years. And in 2017, the last data point in the far right there, we're a little bit above that. So that's good. I think we're, it's reflective of a quality walleye fishing fishery. Now this is the Saginaw Bay open water fishing effort. This is the participation that I was talking about as estimated by the Creel Survey. Now this is hours of participation on the Y axis here. And, uh, and this is just limited to the open water months because that's the most consistently surveyed period that we've had over time. And we can see that generally it's been declining in Saginaw Bay and has kind of leveled off at this lower level here, which is in many respects counterintuitive because walleye have recovered and by all arguments we have one of the best walleye fisheries in North America going on right now. You'd think that it would be the opposite trend instead of going down. So this is a bit of a puzzle as to why fishing effort and participation isn't greater. Now, if you were to plot fishing effort across all the United States, it would actually probably look something like this because generally there's fewer and fewer people recreating the outdoors, fewer kids getting recruited to the sport. Um, it can be a reflection of, of all kinds of demographics like single parent households and, and the economy. Uh, so it's, uh, there's a lot of things going on here, but we can maybe look for some clues as to some individual expo uh, explanations here uh, with our data. So one of them is availability of yellow perch. So this is a yellow perch, this is a scatter plot here, okay? And on the, on the bottom axis is yellow perch angler catch rate, as estimated by the Creel Survey, how many perch per hour. And so the, over here is a better perch fishery, here's a lesser perch fishery. And this is Saginaw Bay data. And then this is the amount of recreational effort. And when you plot that out for all the years that we have Creel Surveys, you can see that you get an increasing line. And what that tells us is that the better the perch fishing, the more participation that you have. So one of the explanations for our decline in effort has been because our, our perch population and our perch fishery has been declining. And although we think, say, I'm going to bet you think walleyes, right? But actually, there's a lot of people out there that are looking for perch. It's really, first and foremost, almost a perch fishery. In fact, all statewide, often yellow perch is the single most sought after species by recreational anglers. So perch are really important. In fact, the quality of the perch fishery explains almost half, that's almost 0.5, half of the variability in fishing effort. So perch is one reason why that's gone down. Another is that it's actually, walleye fishing is so good that it takes less time for walleye fishing parties to catch their limit or at least to reach some level of satisfaction to where they call it a day. So this is a walleye angler catch rate. The better walleye fishing here, lesser walleye fishing here. This is Saginaw Bay data scattered. Uh, and this is mean trip length. So how long a trip, a fishing trip lasts, four hours, four and a half hours, five hours, so on. And we see this kind of a shape to the curve such that as fishing gets better, the trip length actually gets shorter. So it could be a phenomenon that as walleye fishing gets better, people just aren't on the water quite as long for their day, and that can contribute to that decline effort also. Okay, so what are people fishing for? Um, that's part of the, the interview question. So by looking at the interview data, we can create this plot, and we can see that in 2017, and this is pretty typical of most years, that almost half the anglers are reporting that they're fishing, they're targeting um, walleye. About a third are reporting um, yellow perch. This slice here, they just say anything. I'm just fishing for anything. And then there's a breakdown of other species. So this is about what you'd expect, but I think it's interesting and kind of useful to look at. If we look at it by season, then in the open water fishery, it's even more walleye and a little bit less perch. In the ice fishery, though, it's almost two thirds yellow perch that are being targeted, only about 25% walleye. So a big difference between our ice fishery and our open water fishery, but it's still just a back and forth between perch and walleye. And the ice fishery is about 14% of the total effort uh, in most years. This is the seasonality of the walleye harvest. 
And so you can see that most of them are harvested in June, July, maybe May there. A little bit of a bump in the winter. And if we look at yellow perch, it's kind of the opposite, more of a winter fishery, lesser in the summer, then a little bit of a bump in the fall. And if we look at fishing effort, well, it just kind of mirrors that. Uh, the ice fishery here, and then the open water fishery here, lesser fishing going on March, April, and then of course in the fall. So really no surprises there. So one of the things that we ask in the interviews is if you released any walleyes, and not just any, but whether you released any fish that were legal that you could have kept, and then of course how many sublegals did you, did you let go? And in that case, that would be like 12, 11, 10 inches. That's what these two lines are here, and this is just the rate, the release rate across angler hours. And so you can see that there's always some people that are releasing legal, fit, legal size fish they could have kept, not many. What's of more interest is the sublegals that are being released. And here's where we implemented the 13 inch length limit, and it went down, which is exactly as you'd pre predict, because now you can keep those 13 inches and 14 inches. A lot of people said, you know, I'm, I don't like the idea of keeping those small walleyes, but that data suggests that, in fact, they did. There was no problem with that. <laughs> but interesting, look what happened in 2017. That rate shot way up. I don't think there was a change in behavior of anglers. Rather, we have evidence of another strong walleye year class coming up the pipeline. And those were 9, 10, 11 inch fish, 12 inch fish, and um, they had to be released. And I'll show you that in some, some other slides. So I, I asked the question, how much of the harvest is a result of the liberalized bag limit? So remember we went from five to eight fish. So by looking at the interview data in the krill survey, I asked the question, well how many, like for a single party angler who had a limit of eight fish, how many of those fish that they caught were a sixth fish, a seventh fish, or an eighth fish? In other words, beyond five. And same thing for each party size. So two anglers, in theory, could keep up to 16. How many were the 10th or the 11th fish, the 12th fish, the 13th fish, and so on? And you plan all this out, you can see there's a lot of fish being harvested beyond what our old statewide default regulation was. In fact, if you look at all these together, it's about a 49% increase. So although the walleye harvest hadn't gone up a whole lot in 2016 or 2017, this data suggests that in fact, um, we are seeing an increase in harvest by virtue of these regulations. It's shorted up, if you will. In fact, maybe by half, half of the walleyes being harvested are a result of that liberalized bag limit. So that seems to be, I guess, working or effective. Now I'm switching from the creel survey information to the gillnet survey that I talked about. <clears throat> in this case, I plotted out all the different fish that we encountered by um, age group. We aged the fish by looking at their spines. There's rings on them, kind of like a, like a tree, and you can count those. And then I looked at how many were just 13 inches and larger. So the, what I'm really getting at here is what sub segment of the walleye population is actually vulnerable by virtue of this 13 inch length limit and which ones are still being protected in terms of ages. And we can see that starting about age three on out, just about all these, these two colors match up, meaning that all the age threes, all the age fours, all the age fives and so on are, are 13 inches or bigger and they can be harvested. The difference we see starts at age two where most of the age twos are 13 inches and larger, but there's some that are being protected. All the age ones are less than 13 inches, so they're being protected. And certainly all the age zeros or young of year are. The reason there's no bar there is because that they don't get caught in our gill nets. They're just too small, but there's lots of them out there. We see those instead in the trolling. So this is the catch rate in our gill nets. Not unlike an angler catch rate, this is now the number of walleyes per net lift on average over the time series. And we can see where things really start to increase by virtue of the increasing natural reproduction. That really happened in 2003, and then we saw them really show up as bigger fish in our time series. So that's kind of what things look like here. And my initial prediction was with the liberalized harvest regulations, reducing the, the harvest, that these bars would start going down, right? <laughs> Look what happened in 2016 and 2017. There's some of the highest levels yet that we've measured. And 2017 is the newest value that we're reporting on here. 
So that's not really what I would have expected, although sometimes this can be influenced by fish timing moving in and out of the bay so it may not always be exactly reflective of the true abundance but one of the things we can do is take that angler catch rate and lay over this to see how much they might agree i think that's always interesting to do we can see that yeah you know it kind of matches up that our gill nets are saying where we have more or fewer walleyes and the fishery is indicated by the angler catch rate for walleye really seems to reflect that So this is, now we're just taking the yearling walleye and calculating that same gill net catch rate. And the reason this is interesting is because this is a good measure of your class strength. In other words, how many walleyes were produced that year. That's always a variables type of thing because it v depends on weather and different things. And back here when we were still doing some stocking, it depended sometimes on stocking. We haven't been stocking for some time. So these are all wild fish out here. We have really strong year classes and weaker year classes. And um, here, in, and I've been predicting that we were due for a bigger year class and sure enough in 2017, we seem to have that. Now that's not the, that's actually because these are yearlings, that's actually the 2016 year class. And I think that's the reason that that uh, re release rate of sublegal fish shot up because those are probably nine, 10, 11 inch fish and people are naturally having to release those. So that's always a good sign that we have more young fish coming up the system. That's, you want that at least periodically. Now this is the trawl catch rate of young of year or sometimes we call them age zero walleye. These are the fingerlings in the fall that would have been hatched that spring. So they haven't even turned one yet. And this is from the tr same trawl data series that Andrew talked about earlier. <coughs> And for a long time, this, well, this is still our first look at your class strength. And for a long time, this was a good predictor. But it has become somewhat decoupled now at this higher density of walleyes. Now that we've recovered, these don't always reflect. And a good example is here's the 2016 year class. It's actually one of the lower bars. But in 2017, as yearlings, remember, it was a strong year class. So that's why we like to look at them as yearlings as well. These percentages on top of each bar is a hatchery contribution. So before everything changed with the food web that resulted in better walleye reproduction beginning in 2003, we were largely dependent on stocking um, in spring fingerlings. And you can see that the majority of the year classes were, in fact, hatchery fish. And that was done with oxytetracycline marking, that, um, the same technology that, that Stephen talked about earlier for Cisco. So that was part of how we knew that this was natural reproduction, because these values went from like 85% down to uh, much lower values. And so we discontinued stocking in 2006, and that's why they're all zeros ever since. All that's now wild natural reproduction. This line that I just popped in here is the catch rate from the main basin uh, survey series that's done by the Great Lakes Science Center. Remember I talked about that as one of the information sources? And you can see here how alewives have become scarce in Lake Huron. Um, Katie talked about still seeing some alewives in Chinook. If you have a Chinook, they're very good at finding what few alewives remain. But on the whole, alewives are very scarce, almost non-existent in, in Lake Huron. Um, and what few we have seem to be in the northernmost reach, kind of closer to Lake Michigan. So we believe that this is the, the big food web change that principally allowed for uh, a resurgence of walleye natural reproduction or reproductive success. Because alewives are a formidable predator and competitor, a newly hatched perked fry, like walleye and yellow perch. So there was a lot of consequences to alewives disappearing. They had impacts for our Chinook salmon fishery. But the benefits of that, the, the flip side, is much better natural reproduction of some of our native species like walleye, yellow perch, and lake trout. So I already told you we quit stocking in 2006, but I wanted to show you what was going on um, in terms of numbers. These are in thousands, so this would be actually two million which is where things peaked out. And we had a management strategy before alewives took themselves out of the game, was to create a predation barrier by trying to stock up the walleyes so as, to, so as that they would eat the alewives before they came into the bay and try to promote better walleye reproductive success. That was kind of the strategy we were working on until 
nature took care of itself and took the allies out of the system and then walleye reproductive success exploded and so we were able to quit stocking. This is the trend in growth rate for walleye using just age three. This is sexes combined, males and females. And, and age three is being used just because it's a convenient indicator. And there's all kinds of um, reasons why we don't want to track this, but it's not just in terms of how big the walleyes get, but rather that this is an indicator of how many walleyes are out there. So we're using growth rate as a surrogate for telling us where that walleye population is relative to the capacity of the bay to sustain walleye. And when I say capacity of the bay, I mean the prey base, the habitat. And this is the state average for an age three walleye when you collect it in August or September. And we're doing our survey work in September. It's at this level, which is about 15 and a half inches um, on that axis there. And you can see where we used to be before we had walleye recovery, where they're growing way faster. Well, that's nice, you want to have faster growing walleye. But that tells us that they were subsisting at a, a density much lower than what the bay could sustain or support. Because growth rate of fish is usually density dependent. That the more you have, the slower they're going to grow. The fewer you have, the faster they're going to grow. So this might look nice in terms of fast growing walleye, but it really told us we didn't have very many walleye. We established a recovery target at 110% of the state average growth rate. So this is a target level that once we had three out of five year classes in a row that were at or below that level, we would reach a recovery targets. Not that we really wanted slower growing walleyes, but rather that we wanted the density to increase, that we were willing to forfeit some growth, to have them come down into this range. And that's when we knew that we would be at the capacity of the habitat and the prey base. So we were letting the, the fish essentially tell us when they were recovered. And that was first achieved in 2009, so technically that's the year the walleye population recovered, or at least met our recovery targets, was 2009. And you can see where it's been ever since. Now it's been creeping back up, and that's consistent with some of our indicators that suggest that on the whole, the walleye population is getting somewhat smaller than it was at its peak here. Remember the harvest, for example, that shot up and then it came down to kind of an intermediate level. And I'll show you some other graphics in support of that. And here's the 2017 value. We're still in that range, but it's, it's been coming up some. And this can also be affected not just by density, but also by trends in the prey base. What's going on there, too? This is the number of Master Angler Awards over time. And you can see once we achieved our recovery targets, um, on average there was fewer being given out for Saginaw Bay walleyes than there once was. This is just another way of looking at it, another indicator that um, we're, we don't have as many big trophy-sized fish as we once did. And that's part, that seemed to be part of the consequence of recovery. So we have a computer model that allows us to estimate how many walleyes are actually in the Saginaw Bay population. And in this case, we're looking at age two and older. So if you were to include age ones and zeros, it would be an even bigger number. But this is what was going on. At their peak, there was about four million. And uh, in most recent values, it's come down to whatever that is, about two and a half or two and a quarter million. Um, and this, it says 2016, but that's for the fishing year. So that actually reflects data through the spring of 2017. And then the dashed line is just a confidence interval. So we're, we're statistically confident that the true value is somewhere between those dashed lines. And that's, and the, that's what the, 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 the main colored line is indicating. So right now we're, it's coming down, it's suggesting, but um, it's still uh, an abundant walleye population. And of course, it's all wild now. It's natural reproduction, not hatchery sustained. So now we'll switch from walleye to yellow perch. We're going back to the creel survey information. And this is trends in yellow perch harvest. And this is year round, so this includes the ice fishery. This green bar or line rather is the harvest on this axis. And this is the angler catch rate, how many yellow perch per hour. And you can see how this has been going down over time. And today in 2017, or last year rather, it's a fraction of where it was as recently as the 1980s. So this is part of what concerns us, 
And I'll, I'll have a slide here shortly that explains why um, we can have good reproduction of perch, but yet we're, we seem to be having a declining fishery, and I'll, I'll show you that. But this is, it's, it's a fraction of where it was. So that's the recreational fishery. This is the commercial reporting. Remember, the state licensed trap net fishery is allowed to harvest yellow perch eight and a half inches and larger. And they too have been going down just like the recreational fishery is. And these are averages um, over these different range of years until, well, in 2017, it was 51,000 pounds, which sounds like a lot, but that's a small fraction of what it used to be. So the commercial fishery is trending the same way as the recreational fishery. In fact, I, I think a lot of the, the commercial operations are not even targeting perch anymore. These are just the incidental caught in with their whitefish fishery, typically. So getting back to the question of the effectiveness of the regulation changes, how many uh, fishing parties of different sizes reached their 25 fish limit? Now, there's no way that we can ask how many would have reached their 50 limit or something beyond 25 because obviously they're stopping at 25. But we can see what proportion are reaching their limit. In 2017, that was 11% of all fishing parties were reaching their yellow perch limit. That's a pretty big number. And really interestingly, when we calculated that for 2016, it was also exactly 11%. So that's always neat when you get that kind of consistency over time. This suggests to me that the, um, in spite of the decline in perch, uh, that at times and places, people are still getting some good perch fishing, and that this regulation of the 25 instead of 50 is actually having some biological effect that's benefiting the perch in, in, by conserving them in Saginaw Bay. Now this is back to some of Andrew's trawling data. This is the catch rate for 10 minutes of those trawl toes of yellow perch. And there's two different sizes here. Now the, the yellow bars are the young of year, YOY, that's the age zero, so those newly hatched ones. And, and this time of year, they'd be small fingerlings like that. that we're doing the survey. This purple bar is all the yearling and older yellow perch. And that's the ones we're interested in, right, that we would like to catch or the commercial fishermen would like to catch. We can see since 1970, for a long time, we had a lot of big older perch and we had some strong ear classes of young perch and that's just what you'd expect. And all that kind of changed in the 90s, kind of coincident with the invasion of zebra mussels and some other things were going on. But what's really interesting is what happened in 2003. 2003 is when the alewives disappeared. That's the same year that walleye reproduction exploded. Well, so did yellow perch. Look at all the young of year that we had in the trawl. In fact, the, the, the height of this bar is actually 2,451. That'd be like way up in the, on the wall there. We had to truncate it because it's only 1,000 there. And it's been strong ever since. So there's no problem with yellow perch reproducing. The problem is that they don't survive to age one and older. So we have a mortality problem. In fact, in some years where we've calculated the, the, the number of young yellow perch and then that senior class the next year, we have as much as 99% mortality. Well, obviously you're not going to have any very many older perch with that kind of mortality rate. So we have lots of real small young perch, but not the big older ones. So why is that? What's going on? Where are they all going? Well, Katie kind of already <laughs> did that for us. They're in walleye stomachs, and not just walleye, they're in pike stomachs, too. Somebody said, oh, my husband got a pike, and they had 100, you know, or a whole bunch of young perch. All the predators are eating these abundant young perch. Cormorants are eating young perch at certain times of the year. Now, this is our diet data, kind of like what Katie showed you, but this is from our gillnet caught fish. And uh, you can see for years, it went back and forth between alewives and gizzard shed. Both of them croupeds. So you go back and forth between whichever one was kind of abundant. And then in 2003, that changed. This color here is yellow perch. And now yellow perch are a major feature of walleye diet, at least at the time of year that we're doing our survey work in the fall. Now, we still see some gizzard shad represented, but it's not really creating uh, much relief for the yellow perch. And these are mostly age zero or young yellow perch, typically, uh, that they're being fed upon. <clears throat> and interestingly, Katie's data suggests that that's not just in the fall. That seems to be going on all through the summer and spring as well. So um, something's changed. And I think really that the alewives were important uh, as a predation buffer, that the walleyes would feed on the, on the, on the 
the alewives instead of the yellow perch. Now, historically, Saginaw Bay had lots of walleye and yellow perch. There's no reason you can't have healthy populations of both at the same time. But I think that in the case of Saginaw Bay, it really depended on the alewives to be uh, a prey buffer on them. And in the case of the alewives, these weren't adult alewives. These were the young of year that were using the bay as a nursery ground for about the first summer before they outmigrated to the main basin. Now, alewives are an invasive species. They came into the Lake Huron and became abundant in the early 1950s. Something probably played that same role beforehand. And our hypothesis is that that was Cisco. So there's all kinds of reasons why Cisco restoration is important and useful to Saginaw Bay. So that's what Steve, or to Lake Huron, that's what Steve talked about. But one of them is that if they take off in the bay and they survive and they reproduce there, they may play the role that alewives took over and then create a, a forage buffer that will protect the old perch. So actually, the Cisco work in some respects, is a strategy to benefit yellow perch, in a way, and other species, too. That's our hopes, anyway. That's one of the, the, our hypotheses and our, our hopes. Um, <clears throat> but there's a link, but this is premised on a linkage that Saginaw Bay and Lake Huron itself are linked in that the production of pelagic fishes in, the, in Lake Huron that use Saginaw Bay as a nursery ground has consequences for the dynamics and the interaction between predators and prey, with, in this case, with, with some undesirable outcomes for yellow perch. So this is what we're trying to piece together in terms of how this fish community and the ecology works. So speaking about yellow perch, I'll finish up here by talking about their growth rates. And this kind of confirms, just like what we realized with walleye, that at low densities, they're going to grow really fast. Looking at their age threes again, so this is the only good side of not having many yellow perch is that what few do survive, they grow really well, and that's nice. But really, this isn't healthy. This is a state average. They really ought to be down here. So if we're successful in improving and increasing yellow perch abundance someday, that number, will, that value will come down. This is the yellow perch total annual mortality rate. So the mortality rate can be thought of as the proportion or the percent of all yellow perch that are dying each year. Harvesting, being eaten by predators, all sources of mortality. And this bounces around. This is a hard metric to estimate. So there's some assumptions here that are unlikely and it's a little bit flawed. But on the whole, we can kind of see where things are at. And we can see it in 2017, it's right in line with where it's been, but it's right about 60%. So that's a, it's not a high mortality rate for yellow perch if it's a healthy population. But if you don't have young fish coming up and replacing those that are disappearing, you can imagine how that purple line, remember the big yellow perch, are gonna, they're going to disappear real quick and you're not going to have much left for yellow perch. So the mortality rate is high given that we don't have very much survival of our young fish. Well, Andrew already showed you this. This is just sort of the, the forage fish um, index representing all these different species over time. This big year here was when um, white perch first invaded. Remember, white perch are an Atlantic species or an invasive species. And this time series goes back far enough to when the bay was still really polluted. And I think that's why these numbers are so low. But what we're most interested in here is what's been going on recently. And you can see that the prey fish density has been declining about the same time that walleye recovered. And, and so this is a little bit predictable, but the fishery managers really grew concerned about this by the time we started to get around 2014, 2015. And this is one of the impetuses for changing those walleye harvest regulations was to try to reverse this trend. And we saw some reversal uh, up into 2016, but the most recent 2017 value was kind of lower. So this is one that we're watching closely in the, into the future. Almost done here. This is the uh, total annual mortality rate for walleyes. I showed you that for a, mi a minute ago for yellow perch. This is for walleyes. And these are just different ages because sometimes different ages of walleyes will have different mortality rates. But you can kind of see in the most recent value here, and this is actually 
uh, data through March of 2017 called the 2016 fishing year, range between these two values here, the high and low. So that's about 28% up to about 35%. And that's, re that's very sustainable for a healthy walleye population. So this is good because remember, we liberalized things. We don't want to overdo it. We don't want to risk over harvest. This is suggesting to us that there's no indication that we're pushing it too hard, at least with that metric. This is the percent of our spawning stock biomass, which is basically the biomass or the poundage, if you will, of female walleyes in the bay relative to the unfished uh, value. And there's a whole explanation as to how we calculate that. We don't have time to get into that. Suffice it to say that we've set a benchmark that we don't ever want to be below 20%. So if we're overfishing, we'd expect that maybe this value is going to start to get below that line. And here's where we are in 2016 fishing year to March of 2017. We're well above that. So this is just one more metric that kind of reassures us that we're not over harvesting. Uh, lastly, this is the exploitation rate of age four and older walleyes. Exploitation rate can be thought of as a percentage of, well, in this case, age four and older walleyes that are being harvested by the fishery. And we have both the recreational fishery here and then the total fishery, which includes extractions of our Saginaw Bay stock of walleyes that includes sources from outside of Saginaw Bay, because some of our walleyes, remember, out-migrate into Lake Huron. So they're exposed to commercial fisheries in Ontario, tribal fisheries in northern Lake Huron. Not a lot of walleyes, but enough that it makes a difference. So we can see that the exploitation rate is ranging between about uh, 12 and maybe 18 or 20 percent. And again, for a healthy walleye population, that's entirely sustainable. So a summary, it appears that um, the walleye harvest and mortality rates are increased as a result of the liberalized regulations. Um, even though it didn't like go up to record levels, it's higher than it would have been had they not been in place. Um, the low fishing effort prevents us from having a more profound effect of these uh, regulations. Maybe that's actually good and that it kind of helps us to make sure that we aren't overdoing something. Um, but something else is limiting the fishery in, in terms of um, either access or angler population size, economy, reputation, availability of yellow perch, we talked about that. Uh, some walleye metrics might be driven by trends in forage fish production as much as or more than by predation. Uh, yellow perch seem to be holding their own, but the data doesn't really support the idea that they have improved significantly in abundance. Even though I know at certain times and places you're, you might have a good perch fishing trip, um, that's because they may school up, first ice, last ice, those kinds of things, but on the whole, we see from these statistics that it's a fraction of what it was historically. Um, none of the walleye metrics point to any signs of overharvest right now. The walleye population size structure indicates that we generally have a low abundance of trophy sized fish. So in terms of a quality fishery, depending on how important that is to you, that might be a concern. Um, and it could result from disproportional mortality patterns and effects of sore growth. So. We've been talking about this with the Lake Huron Citizens Advisors and consulting with them, reflecting on all this data, and the decision was for 2018 to leave the regulations uh, the same, no change for one more, at least one more year, and, and then of course to look at this throughout the coming year and again intensively next winter and reflect on this with the potential to maybe become more conservative or, or maybe more liberalized. Well, that'll be decided. Um, about a year from now. And I think uh, probably Randy and Jim Baker are going to speak more to that as I am finished. If, Brandon, do we have time for questions? Yeah, exactly. Okay, way in back. Uh, this is a question about terrific presentation. I have a question specific to walleye, and obviously it's been a decade or more since you've done walleye fishing. My understanding is that we still have these terrific deer classes coming through. Are you have a sense geographically? <coughs> So the question was, where are these wild walleye being produced from? <clears throat> and uh, the, is, it, is the Titabwasi the main producer? And that's consistent with our understanding in general, is that the Titabwasi is probably the largest of the, the, the different spawning runs. But there are certainly walleye spawning up the Shiawasi, the Cass, all, you know, all the way up to the Flint, 
the Cuckoon River, the Agre River, there are other sources. And historically, they were spawning in offshore reefs, and we believe there's still trace levels of that, although not, not nearly as abundant. So probably the Titoblasti is a good bet. Um, there was some work done out of Central Michigan University a while back. Um, it didn't get very far because of some funding issues, but they were looking at the chemistry of the otolith bones to see if that could give them clues as to what watershed they came from. And that preliminary data suggested that actually the Coquitlam may be a bigger producer than the Titoblasi. But they never really could confirm that, but it, it suggests to us that maybe we don't fully know where they're all coming from. And that's an important consideration because uh, we want to think about how and where we want to protect those habitats and those kinds of things, or where there might be benefits in terms of fish passage approval, and dam removals, those kinds of things. So we don't fully know that, but you know, the Titoblasi probably, in fact, is at least a very big producer. Other questions? Yes, right here. Just uh, standing here in the presentation that the uh, carbon catch rate around 0.4 is what Lake Erie has been trying to at. You mentioned something about adjusting that out here to adjust that target catch rate. How do you adjust it? What do you adjust to to get that target catch rate you're trying to get to? So, so the question was the targeted catch rate of 0.4 walleyes per hour like they, they have in Lake Erie. And, and we looked at where the Saginaw Bay data was with that. <clears throat> and I think the question is, well, how do you adjust that? And when I said that, what I meant was we can adjust the targets or we can pick our own targets. The, the angler catch rates themselves, we don't really have a lot of influence over. Although this is specifically a metric where we're asking that subset of fishermen who say they're only fishing for a walleye? They're rigged up for a walleye. They're going, you know, they're they're optimizing their trip for a walleye. That's the catch rate there that we're looking at, not the diluted one where it might capture shore fishermen looking for perch or the bass or something. You showed the So can we affect the angler catch rate, in other words? Well, th that's a reflection of the quality of the fishery and in terms of generally about um, how many walleyes are available. So in some respects, we are affecting that by, say, with the minimum length limit um, being reduced from 15 to, to 13 inches, that opened up more fish to be harvested. That probably is one way that you could increase uh, angler catch rates. Generally, you're just striving for an abundant and healthy walleye population. That's what gets catch rates up. Okay, this person, I'll get to you back there. Yes. Have you seen an increase in, uh, in uh, accessibility for fish with where dam structures of, was it Shiawassee cast? Those the, the rock ramps is what you're thinking about? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that one was in Frankenmuth, and where else, Jim, was? Chesney, right? And so those are intended to just be exactly as it described, a ramp that can, a fish can migrate up and then get over and, and to spawn. And um, they're still being evaluated, and there's some indication that they have had some success, um, but that they also um, are limited. They, not all fish are able to get over. There's actually some indication that the, the more the ice and spring flows mess with it, the, they actually become a little more effective and they, they kind of undo the man-made part of it. So there's, you know, there's maybe a potential that they're going to be even better. You want to say anything more about that, Jim? Um, with regard to those uh, fishways, we have learned that in years where we have good, strong <coughs> spring flows, which unfortunately is not this year, uh, we get more fish over the fishways. Uh, in years where that are like this one, where we have relatively low spring flows, those are the years the fish move up to the fishway, and a lot of them seem to spawn in the fishway, uh, but they don't get over. So a lot with these uh, fishways depends on what kind of uh, flows you get at the time of year when the walleyes are, are actively trying to move upstream. And uh, you know the fishways are far from perfect, but they do pass fish at least in some years. Whereas the dams that were there before didn't let anything get done. Yeah, so many improvement. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's it's better than nothing. And also they're made out of rock. So what I, I think we've seen some evidence that the fish are spawning right in the the the, the rock ramp, which is good too. One of the species that we'd really love to see get access to 
historic spawning grounds are lake sturgeon, and we're pretty sure they're not able to make use of those ramps. So they're not perfect by any means, but it's a step in the right direction. But the fish passage, dam removal, those are big issues for the Saginaw Bay watershed. Okay, in back, uh, with a glass, yeah. Can you consider the possibility that those parts of the year Okay, so the, the question was, is it possible that the young of year yellow perch that disappear, dying and disappearing are actually something else other than just predation? Um, we think that predation is really the principal explanation because we see them in the diets of all the predators that we look at, even cormorants sometimes. But um, there is a possibility that it could be something else. I don't, we don't see any particular evidence. We handle enough of them that we don't see any real evidence of VHS in those, that's a fish disease. But there was some evidence or suggestion that they may have been thermally or energetically compromised because some of those big year classes that were so big that they were super small going into the winter and if you have a nice hard winter, they maybe didn't have the fat reserves or didn't get big enough to survive. So there could be a density, climactic, energetic thing in some years. But, I, you know, we've had some mild winters too and we're still not seeing it. So I don't think even that's a, a main explanation. There's one more question in the back here. Yes. What's the reasoning for the 25 limit on the perch in the bay and 50 limits in the river? Well, that's a perfect segue, I think, to what the managers are maybe going to touch on here in this next uh, segment. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to defer that to, to Randy and, and, and Jim Baker to talk to them. See, I hand the hard questions off to them. So, we'll end on, on the question that we're going to defer. So with that, and, and I think as we get into the management conversation, if we want to come back to some questions that you might have for Dave, I think we can definitely entertain those. But I want to keep us... Moving along, and um, we're sort of, well, first of all, I want to thank, you know, Dave. So we need that one more time. So, so you know, these guys work hard in collecting all of this information. There's a lot of partnered agencies uh, pooling data and talking back and forth. And you could imagine that every one of those slides that Dave shared could be a 15, 20 minute presentation in and of itself. And the job that these guys are doing tonight is summarizing a lot of data in a very uh, concise way so that we can understand it and make sense of it as an angler. So I want to appreciate all the work that went in uh, to not just that presentation, but the, all of these that you've been hearing this evening. So uh, now what we're going to try to do is segue into a management uh, conversation. And um, uh, largely, uh, Randy Clairlot and, and Jim Baker are going to cover that from a fisheries perspective. But I wanted to introduce uh, Tim Wilson from USDA Wildlife Services. There's Tim. And, 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 and I wanted to invite him, and, and he agreed to talk about the cormorant management update. We know that this uh, communities are interested in cormorant management. And if you follow some of the federal conversations, you know that there's, uh, you know, there's kind of a uh, holding pattern of, of where that management process is. And so what USDA Wildlife Services does is they manage uh, the cormorants uh, based on a lot of uh, regulatory process. And, and Tim's going to kind of just lay out where, where, the, where, where that is and sort of maybe who the actors are and, 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 and so forth. So with that, I'll pass it off to you, Tim. And I'll... All right, thanks, Brandon. Um, yeah, I just wanted to give everybody a quick update of where things stood with some of the management efforts that we've been doing the last, well, since 2007 is really when we started um, being asked by the state to become involved with doing some um, karma control in some select areas around the state. So I just wanted to give you an update on some of those efforts. Um, give you the, the, the bigger picture of, of where or how we're involved is the Fish and Wildlife Service ultimately has the management authority for cormorants. Um, and through some of the documentation, there's documents called the Public Resource Depredation Order. And what that does is it allows the states to take action where cormorants are causing damage to natural resources. So with the Public Resource Depredation Order, I'll refer to it as the PRDO, that gives the DNR the ability to manage cormorants. And that filters down to us being involved with the, the management, the lethal control. Our agency, USDA, is a, is a non-regulatory agency, so we can't undertake any of these actions without direction from the state and the Fish and Wildlife Service. 
So up until, well, since about 2007, a lot of the work that we've been doing is, is focused at the, the nesting areas, uh, where these birds return year after year. They have a strong site, site fidelity to return to those same areas year after year. So much of the work we've been doing is at the nesting colonies. Um, we also enlist the help of volunteers at, at select stocking locations, as well as spring spawning sites to harass the birds when they show back up. But after that, a lot of the work that we're doing is uh, across some of these, these nesting colonies, um, as in the case of here, being Saginaw Bay, around the Charity Island, the Charity Island, and Spoils Island. So, work that we're doing includes egg oiling. This is spraying the eggs with corn oil that suffocates the developing embryo, which causes the egg not to develop. Over time, that causes uh, declines in the, the cormorant population, and also adult removal. Later in the summer, when those birds are starting to fledge, we go in some of those colonies, take out adults, uh, based on guidelines and goals set forth by the DNR. So over time, we've had some pretty, made some pretty significant strides in meeting the goals set forth by the, by the DNR and the Fish and Wildlife Service. In 2014, we were asked to uh, participate, collect some cormorants in Saginaw Bay around Spoils Island and Little Charity Island to see what these birds were eating. And this is some of the work that was presented earlier. So those additional birds that were taken caused the, the uptick there. Um, these are nest counts. So over time, up until 2016, we'd been making some, some pretty significant strides in, in meeting the goals. So basically what happened, and I'm not going to get into all the details of what was, was the cause here, but basically this, this public resource depredation order was challenged by a group of former public employees that organized themselves and called themselves the, uh, the peer. They filed suit against the Fish and Wildlife Service in 2014 saying that the environmental assessment that was drafted that allows for the, the cormorant management to take place wasn't fully, um, and again, I'm not going to uh, get into the details, but basically it, it didn't fully consider the extent of the actions through the public resource depredation order, how that would affect cormorant populations. Um, so the judge, they sided with this, he sided with this group, and on May 25th of 2016, he vacated the orders, the public resource depredation order, as well as the aquaculture depredation order, which basically shut down our operations here in Michigan. So since then, the Fish and Wildlife Service has done a new environmental assessment, looking at the effects of um, what these two orders have on the, the cormorant population. Unfortunately, though, even though that assessment's been done, they haven't moved forward in reissuing these these two orders. So we're still on the sidelines. Um, this type in italics there on the bottom is actually taken off their website and it says that you know their efforts to reinitiate the orders hasn't been a, a priority as of, of late. So we don't know when it may be they may be issued to allow us to the states to resume management efforts. Um, so basically what this means is the state and private individuals, they can still harass cormorants. They can go out there and harass them with pyrotechnics. Um, but there's no lethal work that can be done. So in 2016 and 2017, um, the state and our agency, we have applied for a depredation permit to try and do some limited lethal control in certain areas. Those were denied. Um, this year, we're in the process of reapplying for a uh, Fish and Wildlife Service depredation order in hopes that we can do some, some limited lethal control in areas uh, for the protection of threatened endangered species. Um, Co Congressman Bergman, he presented a an, uh, bill to the uh, House in February, and this would basically um, direct the Fish and Wildlife Service to reissue these, these orders. Um, this is something that the DNR testified um, on as well. So we're kind of waiting to see what happens there. We haven't heard word yet on the status of this bill that's um, making its way through the, le the legislature. So as far as this year, what we can do is we can do non-lethal harassment. We can go out there, harass the birds in areas that are causing 
concerns with fish plant sites. Um, <coughs> there's threatened endangered species out there. We can go out there. The public can go out there, harass the birds, trying to get them to move on. Um, we're still going to continue doing some nest counts just to see what happens in these sites, these nesting colonies, in the absence of lethal harassment. <coughs> over time, what are those populations doing? Um, and again, like I said, we're going to apply for a depredation or permit, hopefully do some limited lethal control in, in certain areas. So it's not the direction we were hoping to go. It's not the direction the state was hoping to go. But, you know, it's what it is. So that's just a real quick update of, of um, some of the stuff that we're involved with. If you have any questions, I can try and answer them real briefly um, and then hand it over. Yes, sir. Is the Comorach a native of Michigan or is it somebody who used to be Michigan? It's native. Yeah. Yep. Yes, sir. I've been fishing this area since 1950. And I can't remember as a kid ever seeing a cross like this. I mean, going back quite a way, there's guys here that have been around longer than I have, too. This isn't something that been here all along. Native Americans say no. The bird is never in for it. They don't even have a name for it. Oh, the cormorant, they don't have a name for it? No. Mm. The reports were that it came in on a storm back in the 60s. Do you have to use steel shot for those? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not touching that one. <laughs> the state can do everything in its power to get rid of them. And it's like eating your head against the wall because, oh my goodness, the friends of the cormorants are going to come out of the woodwork and pick on us. Right. It, oh my God. Yeah, we some of you do something quick. So. Okay. Any other questions? Any questions? All, right. All right, thank you. Well, I want to thank Tim uh, for coming, Lampy. <laughs> you know, I. Uh, Tim just made that quick update. Uh, you guys know we could spend three hours talking about exactly this issue, and, and we know this community is interested in, in that topic, and so I appreciate Tim uh, kind of giving that update. And, and my point was is that part of our role in this workshop is that you guys leave having a better understanding of the multiple uh, research and management agencies involved in in our fishery, right? And so uh, the Cormoran uh, topic is no different. There's a lot of actors and players at a state and federal level. Uh, some of them are agencies and some of them are, are courts and some of them are public uh, citizen uh, groups. And so that all plays an effect in that process Tim just outlined. And, uh, you know, Tim. Tim's non-regulatory. We're non-regulatory, but what we want you to definitely have that information to understand who the actors are and what the process is. And if you're interested in being involved, maybe who who you who, who you would reach out to. So, with that, um, thank you guys. It's been a long evening, and we are nearing the end. Uh, I appreciate Randy. Uh, Claremont and, and Jim Baker joining us as the managers, right? So uh, Randy is the Lake Huron Basin Coordinator and uh, Jim is the Southern Lake Huron Basin uh, Unit, unit manager, manager Coordinator. They'll explain that in a minute. But essentially, uh, you guys have heard, heard a lot of information, a lot of uh, uh, slides, and a lot of uh, tables and graphs. And I think the, the end of the workshop, we like to traditionally just say, so what? What does it mean from a management pr perspective? What are some quick management updates? Or, or maybe you guys have some questions. And, and these seem like the two that would be able to best answer that. So I'll pass it off to Randy first. I'm just going to speak briefly, hand it to Jim, and then Jim's going to get back to me, and I'm going to speak again, and then we'll just keep going back and forth. How's that sound? Uh, I do want to address uh, one of the questions or statements about cormorants that, that Tim mentioned um, just briefly, and then I'll, like I said, hand it to Jim. So really, hats off to you as concerned stakeholders on the Lake Huron fishery. The only reason that Jack Bergman... Um, our congressman got a bill introduced was because of your voice, your concerns that you expressed to the uh, your representatives in, in D.C. So 
Keep doing it if you are concerned about this issue. The bill is in committee and we provided testimony in support of the bill for co-management of cormorants. Yes, it's a migratory bird. However, uh, we, we co-manage multiple species with the federal government and, the, and this should be no exception. So uh, before I go into my, my points about management, I just wanna say um, if you're so concerned, then make sure you contract, contact your um, representative and uh, ex express your concern. So Jim, we'll turn it over to you and then um, back to me. Okay, thank you, Randy. Uh, I'm kind of going to sum up a few things here. Uh, I'm the uh, manager for the Southern Lake Huron Management Unit and we cover Saginaw Bay and Southern Lake Huron and about 22 counties here in East Central Michigan. So uh, lots of inland water as well as the uh, Great Lakes water. Uh, briefly, I want to uh, take Dave's talk just a step farther. He showed you the data we have to work with. Uh, and so the next question becomes, where do we go from here? And uh, to sort of sum up what he had to say, obviously our walleye fishery is still in good shape and uh, there is no uh, burning need to change regulations in 2018, but that doesn't mean that we're ever really comfortable. So we're continuing to watch this fishery. You saw a bunch of indicators there. Some show that the uh, population's up, some show that it's down, some show that you're catching more fish. Uh, another one that uh, is continuing to interest me is the fact that fishing effort just did not change with liberalized bag limits and size limits. Uh, and I also want to take into account that this last winter the winter of 2017, 2018 was the first one in the three when we've had a really good ice fishery. And in addition to that, we had a real good pre-spawn fishery for about two to three weeks in the Saginaw River before the season closed. So we will be taking that into account once those uh, creole figures are analyzed, which will be, from what I understand, probably May. Uh, and we'll be looking at that and we'll be looking at uh, projecting the summer harvest. And then we'll be talking amongst ourselves about whether we want to change the bag limit or the size limit or both for next year, for 2019. Uh, we have to begin that process fairly early if we want to get the regulations into next year's fishing guide because there's a big long process for doing that and we have learned from talking with our uh, brothers in law enforcement that if you make a regulation more strict you have got to have it printed in the guide or local prosecutors and local judges will not prosecute over limit cases. So we're going to be looking at this uh, very carefully. I think I can safely say we are not going to liberalize the regulations based on what we have seen and what we are projecting. So do not be that surprised if in 2019 we ratchet back a little bit on the, uh, the harvest just to be on the safe side. Dave showed a slide that uh, we like to keep our stock density at least 20%. Well, that's nice. I don't even like to get real close to that number because this is a very important fishery and you might better allow a little extra for a little little variability in nature there. So I'm not one that believes in you know, an old fisheries concept called maximum sustainable yield. I would rather be back from that a little bit. So we'll see where we're at as we go through the, the uh, spring and the summer and uh, you know, stay tuned for possible changes next year. Um, I have another thing that I'd like to bring up uh, and uh, this is something that's kind of going on around the state this year, and I, I, wanna, I want to get a sense of where all of you folks are at on it. So uh, I'm going to ask uh, Catherine and Brandon to do some counting for us. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit. A uh, fellow in the back asked about the difference between inland and Great Lakes perch bag limits, and, and that's kind of where we're going here. You know, there's been a lot of confusion over perch bag limits. Um, the statewide standard is still 50 per day. 
Uh, but we've got an awful lot of exceptions now in the fishing guide. For instance, in Saginaw Bay and the Saginaw River, we're at 25 per day. But it's still 50 in the rivers and the drains that flow into the bay. Um, in Lake Michigan, south of the 45th parallel, it's 35 per day. Up in Lake Gogebic in the UP, you can keep 25 per day, but no more than five of those can be over 12 inches long. That's a youper thing. Um, we've heard from many anglers that our, our regulations are just plain getting too complex and they would like a more understandable statewide regulation. So the fisheries division is considering going to a standardized 25 perch per day statewide bag limit in 2019. And this year, we're taking the opportunity to air the idea out and see how the public will respond to it. Now a 25 perch bag would put the perch limit in line with our current bag limits for other panfish, including bluegill, sunfish, crappies, and rock bass. Um, it would also actually be more in line with perch bag limits in most of the other Great Lakes states. They're, they're in the neighborhood of uh, 25 fish. So some are in combination, yes. Um, so I want to ask you all a few questions. And uh, I'll need you to raise your hands and keep your hands up long enough for folks to count, okay? Uh, and then once they've got the count, then we'll go on to the next thing. Um, of all of you here in the room, how many of you fish for perch at least once in a while? Please raise your hands. Oh my goodness. Okay, you guys get counting. Let me know when you're done. And I gotta turn the page. I'm not big on uh, PowerPoints. I'd rather use notes. Still counting. You both got them, guys? Okay, we've got them. All right. Next question. How many of you have actually caught your limit of 50 perch recently or 25 if you fished in Saginaw Bay. How many people have caught limits? Oh, this is a smaller number. Okay, this won't take as long. You got it? Okay, all right. Okay, here comes the next question. And this is where we're trying to get a sense of, of where you're at. How many of you would live with a statewide, no exceptions, bag limit of 25 perch per day? Wow. You gotta count those. Come on, Tell us if you get to a rowing party in Okay. This is an either or thing when they're done. We're not doing that anymore. We even decoupled bass and pike and all that. Yeah. You got them, Brandon? Okay. The next question. All right. How many of you would rather stay at 50 per day with local exceptions as necessary? Well, that was an easy count. I'll do that. You got one? Okay, good. Put him down. All right, great. Um, all right, so we've got a sense of that that we can take back to Lansing. And we're doing this at all of the Sea Grant workshops. We're going to do it at our annual coffee and conversation meeting here in Bay City. And also the other units are supposed to be asking this same question all over the state so that we get a good gathering of information from all over the state. And uh, we will see after we've taken public comment for this year where we're at. Also, there is going to be a question come out on the, uh, that will come to anyone who bought a fishing license and provided an email. Right, Randy? Uh, and that's a survey that'll be coming along. So if when you bought your fishing license, you gave the, the uh, license uh, machine an email, you will get an email from the fish division asking your opinion of this question. There are, there's 
about three pages of, of questions there. But in any case, I encourage you to take that too. And uh, we'll, we'll put all this together, and if we do make a change, it would not go into effect until the 2019 fishing season. So uh, I appreciate your, uh, your taking part in this. And um, at this point, I guess I'll turn it over to Randy if he'd like to uh, continue. Yes? We want to know the results. Oh, okay. You want the results? Brandon will give you the results. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll report it later. Okay, we'll report it later. Yeah. What's that? We'll report it later. Okay, that's fine. We will have that for you shortly, as soon as they're done adding up their hash marks over here. All right. Watch out for the hanging chads and the votes over there. Um, thanks, Jim, for that. And, and just to follow up his comment, um, the survey that will be going out, we have a million anglers in Michigan. We have about 350,000 email addresses. So this will be the mo one of the most comprehensive surveys ever done in fish division. So if we get public support for this, that regulation will move forward, as Jim mentioned, in 2019. Um, you know, looking at this agenda today uh, one, and working with Brandon and Sea Grant on developing these workshops, one of the most challenging things that we find is actually how can we get limit the topics, I mean the number of topics, and the breadth of information that we want to share and we could go till midnight. I mean somebody mentioned Clodophora, the green, green algae, some of the nutrient dynamics, some of the um, other species, what's going on with white suckers. I mean we could share so much information and, and Brandon's got to try to narrow this down to a list and um, I want to say hats off to the speakers and presenters to Michigan Sea Grant. Uh, let's give them a round of applause for all their hard work, what they did today. So, you know, part of my job is to uh, work with the advisory committee, as Frank mentioned, um, getting input and dealing with management of Lake Huron Basin and some of the threats. And one of the things that, uh, you know, I, Jim Baker here um, is, has worked in this basin for many years, um, knows the fishery very well, right? So he loves when I tell stories about him, so I'm gonna tell him a quick story. Jim, um, <laughs> we were in a meeting, real story, and someone came in and said there's a fish kill. And Jim says, okay, here's what I want you to do. This is a DEQ issue, so they're gonna contact Lansing, DEQ will deal with it, done. And as I'm leaving the meeting, someone coming up to me and they're like, wait, wait, you're not gonna send staff down there? This is a crisis, and I turned to him and I said, I don't think this is Jim's first fish kill. He's been around, he understands. But he called me the other day and he said, an angler handed in a stomach and in this, in this bucket were the species and Catherine and I think it's a sea robin. Have you ever heard of a sea robin? Yep. yep. A sea robin is a marine coastal species common in the Gulf of Mexico, the Atlantic Ocean suspected to be found and they identified it correctly from a Lake Huron caught fish. So one of the things I'm going to give to Jim today, uh, maybe this is the theme, uh, uh, old dog, new tricks. <laughs> but here is a guide uh, uh, to all the invasive species. And I looked at the first three pages. This has just come out, you know, um, the New Zealand mud snail, the um, uh, Chinese mystery clam. I mean, this whole book are species and threats that we have to worry about that he's got to get his staff. So if they see one of these in the field, they got to be aware. There's, there's tons of pages and species I've never even heard about. So we look at the Lake Huron threats, they're real. And the reason why these workshops are so important is that your awareness is what matters. Your involvement and the way you care for the fisheries, being here tonight, having the conversations, this is this is what's important. We all care about this fishery and there are threats to the system. So, you know, I look at that and I just say, be aware of it. Let me follow up on Oh, he, he wants to talk about the sea robins for a second. Yeah, I just want to follow up on that because that was one of the weirder things we've run into lately. However, we got to looking at that fish and there were two or three of them there in the bottom of this guy's cooler and they were all dried up. Well, it turns out he had spent the winter in Florida and he had uh, caught some fish down there that had regurgitated those fish and they had been laying in the bottom of his cooler since then 
and had dried up pretty darn good. Uh, so they did not come out of a lake trout, they just happened to be in the cooler all dried up when he threw a lake trout in there. So this is fish detective work that Catherine and I get into periodically, and it can be rather entertaining, so. Yeah, I would have never figured that out. But it, certainly, um, you know, looking again at, at just the involvement, I wanna, I wanna kind of follow up with all the great presentations and kind of give you, from, a, from my perspective as a basin coordinator, I grew up in the thumb, and the fisheries is really important to us. Uh, three take-home messages. And the first one I've just mentioned, and that is, please stay informed. Stay informed about what's going on. And if you have ideas that you want it, uh, more information about, contact your Sea Grant uh, coordinator, contact Brandon or Jim's office. Um, and maybe next year we can bring more of these topics to talk about, or even in the, uh, in the course of the year, have dialogue about things that you're seeing in the field. Stay informed and stay involved. Um, number two, you know, uh, Frank mentioned it in his comment about the advisory committee. Um, we work hand in hand with the stakeholders to make the best decisions for Lake Huron and its fisheries. So being involved also means, or being informed also means, when you see opportunities that you can get involved, communicating your interests, we take those into account because it, we want a very viable and productive fishery for everybody. So that's number two. The last one I'm gonna kind of conclude a story that, that I had. Um, so I was in grad school and I was a, a student working on some projects and some local schools said, can you come and teach the kids about some of these invasive species and, and fish identification? So came up with this idea to put a whole bunch of species in, a, in buckets and they'd have to look in and try to identify them and there'd be a question above the bucket like, where does this species like to live? Or where, what does this species eat? And in the last bucket, the question was, which this species has the biggest impact on aquatic systems. Yeah, and you know what was in the bottom of the bucket? A mirror. a mirror. And so you as the stakeholders, you know, and this is what I do with my job, it's the people that really matter in terms of protecting the resource, valuing the resource, and using the, the fishery. So um, the third take home point would be, if you can, take a kid fishing. Take, take a youngster or take somebody out who hasn't fished and get them out there, get them involved because their involvement will protect the next generation of, uh, of the lake and the fisheries uh, for years to come. So that's all I have. I think we have a few minutes for questions, but I really want, uh, appreciate everyone coming. Results of the poll. Oh, we got the results. Results of the perch poll, then we'll go to questions. All right, according to Brandon and Catherine, 46 people uh, said that they fish for perch. Um, as to how many people caught limits in the recent past, uh, the number was eight. Uh, how many people would live with a uh, statewide bag of 25? We had, well, I have two numbers here, either 53 or 54. Uh, I'll give him a little bit of room for error there. but. So uh, there are people here who don't actively fish for perch that still think it's a good idea. And nobody said they wanted to stay at uh, 50 with the clearance exceptions. So that's how we came out. Now we'll be happy to take your questions. Yep. Hold on. And while you're asking questions, if you work on your surveys, I would appreciate that. Uh, I, I do like I always do. I want my fishing license at store. And that has really been guided and mentioned like the ability to come out to have the license on your cell phone and stuff like that. And there's a website that goes out there and register and put my information and put my email in that and it's like, is that what you're going from to the so you can get it or uh, you just give them an email that would make my register that it can't be good uh it goes on the driver's license get pulled up my information and my my license was there uh -huh. so is that where you're correct if I did you at the store if I put it in there is that yeah so um 
and I and may, the, we have law enforcement representative here in the back, but my understanding is this is a new change that when you do your license online, if you have a screen capture of your license and your receipt on your phone. That's what's well, actually, it's actually a PDF that you print off or they can download on your phone. Yep. All the license, which you have to have your driver's license with you, it's based on your driver's license number and your, and your birth date to correspond with that. That's correct. Would you agree? In terms of the the fishing license is on the phone. Yep. It's lawful. Just be advised. Uh, you're handing out your smartphones in the bay, and it's wavy out. <laughs> 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 Sometimes having that paper is nice to hand it off. Yeah, I, I it does a lot better with a lot of that smartphone. Yeah, but the license, the email, like put on that one. That's exactly the Yes, the email is. Yep. Go yep. Ahead, is there a has there been any talk or any interest in leaving the river open year-round? For, for walleye? Yeah, I'll take that one. Our purpose in liberalizing the regulations was to carefully and thoughtfully uh, increase the harvest of walleye in order to decrease predatory pressure on perch. It was not to institute a slaughter. And if the river were open year-round, that is most assuredly what we would have as a slaughter. And we just do not want to go there. Uh, the fish from all over Lake Huron are concentrated in that river during that six weeks of the year. And it, compared to like the Detroit River, that's a very, very tiny body of water. And we believe that would be way too much exploitation for this population. So whatever adjustments we make will be within the purview of the regular inland walleye season. In the efforts of bringing the perch back, when they took the half the limit away from a sportsman, did they reduce the other side, commercial fishermen down to half? Uh, we can't do that by statute, but we did have a process by which we worked with one particular commercial fisherman who owned four licenses in Saginaw Bay, and he was interested in getting out of the bay and fishing for whitefish. And we're in the third year of that process, uh, and he has been fishing that whitefish permit out at Harbor Beach, and as a result, as of in year three, he was not allowed to keep any um, yellow perch on any of those four inland licenses. Now, if we can, that was the way we were able to have some impact on the commercial fishery because the only way that you can change perch harvest in Saginaw Bay is by change, having the legislature change the law, okay? Uh, there are still, I think, about eight active licenses or 11 in the bay and um, there are some that are considerably more active than others uh, in terms of. Uh, I'm sure that you could work that out, and that is uh, an option that we have looked at, but we haven't got any support from above us for any kind of a buyout. Because like years ago, you used to select that box. You want to support the Loon Foundation. Yep. I think every angle would throw five bucks towards. If you can convince your legislators to uh, add that to the license law, that's fine. But it's not something that we can just unilaterally do. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'd like to thank you for keeping a handle on the population of the walleye and the size and willing to adjust accordingly. I think that's great. It shows that you're on top. Of it. Uh, another thing, as far as perch catch, uh, never, never fished for perch in uh, probably 15 years. Make sure you catch a lot of them. Good. Glad to hear it. Anyone else? Over here. Yeah, the commercial fishermen, was last year, the last year that this individual could keep perch? Uh, he was not able to keep perch on those four licenses in 2017. So all the he buy four he licenses? Bought. Yes, he bought another license. So that's, what he's the that's right. He's fishing that other license now. Uh, there's no way we could stop him from doing that. So, yes. What's going on with the uh, Gage's carp? I hear there's a new snakefish or something. Uh, what's going on with the Asian carp? Well, and at, at this point, we don't have any indication that uh, the black or the, well, black, silver, or bighead carp 
have made it out of the Chicago Canal and into the Great Lakes. They use something called environmental DNA to check for the presence of these fish in our rivers, and uh, they have checked in Saginaw Bay and in the Saginaw and Titabawasi rivers. We found no indication that they are here at this point. We do have some grass carp. They are uh, down in Lake Erie, and we have seen a handful of them up here, but I think in uh, my 31 years here, I can count all the grass carp I've seen on one hand and have a finger left over. So they're not real common. Uh, as far as, uh, he also mentioned the snakehead fish, and that is something that has turned up on the east coast. Uh, we had one incidence of it turning up in a river in Wisconsin. Uh, we have never seen one here. We have a lot of people that mistake dogfish for snakeheads, but it's very easy if you know your fish to tell them apart. So we have not seen them here, and we don't have Asian carp here yet. What else we got? Way in the back. Um, the last time we heard from you guys in the Bay City, and a lot of that talk about the new commercial fishing regulations. Uh -huh. Is there a little bit on what's going on with that? Is it any of that stuff? Well, I don't know a lot. I understand that a uh, Senator Green has uh, written a bill, but at this point, I don't believe anything much has happened yet. So nothing has really changed with regard to that at this point. Anybody else? I think we've talked them to death. <laughs> oh, there's one. What does your mean? What does What is my main concern? The resource trying to maintain these fisheries not just for now but for the future. And that's my, my really one and only concern, is trying to keep these fisheries not only for us to, to have fun with now, but for whoever comes after us. And that's why I tend to be kind of conservative about my approach to regulations. I don't like to push envelopes too hard. No, you do a real good job. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank, you thank you much. With that, I want to say thanks to our managers and thanks to all of our speakers and thanks to you guys. Once again, these workshops don't happen if you guys don't show up to participate. Much appreciated. Um, you're, on my, you're on my mailing list for next year, so we hope to see you back uh, for the 2019. For now, go enjoy some good fishing and safe travels wherever you're headed this evening. Don't